Today on the SSPX podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into the status of the Society of St. Pius X. It seems every few years, a fresh wave of concern ripples through the Catholic faithful considering the SSPX. Are they schismatic? Do they have a legitimate jurisdiction within the Catholic Church? Can one attend their masses, confessions, get married, and receive confirmation at their chapels without fear of sin? What about their controversial opinions, such as their stance on the new Mass? In short, why does the SSPX do what it does? And how does it have the authority to do what it does? We'll take a deep dive into all of these questions over the next two and a half hours with the District Superior of Canada, Father David Sherry. So if you have questions about the SSPX, here's your place to start. And we'll start right now. Father Sherry, it is great to have you back. How are you, Father? I'm doing very well, Andrew. Um, I visited recently the wonderful city of Phoenix, so I know how how lucky you yes. are living in that uh, perpetual summer. It is. It is nice. Uh, we do have a little bit of rain today, so you know things are a disaster here in Phoenix. Uh, oh my you goodness! Think driving in the snow is bad. Try driving in the rain with a bunch of Phoenicians. Uh, they don't know what to do. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! But no, all, all is well. Thank God. Very good. Well, Father, we wanted to have you on as uh, a priest of the Society of St. Pius X, also as the District Superior for Canada for the Society of St. Pius X, um, to talk about some concerns that have been raised recently um, in various outlets. Various various people have raised objections to the status of the Society of St. Pius X. Uh, this is nothing new. Um, the Society of St. Pius X has had to defend its position many times over many years, over many decades. Um, and so I, like you and I were just talking before this, I normally don't interject myself in these podcasts. Um, I try to let the priest do the talking and I'm just here to facilitate. But in this case, I will be, um, and father, I'll be playing the role, not really playing the role. Actually, I will just be asking fair questions. Um, I'm not a member of the society of St. Pius X. I choose to go to SSPX chapels. Because I think that is the best place for my family, for our salvation. Beyond that, that's it. Um, and so I want to ask fair questions about this. And I want to ask questions that have come up in my own mind that sometimes have concerned me, just to be completely fair and, and honest with you, Father. So thank you for taking the time to, to go through this all with us. And with that all said, where would you like to start? <laughs> Well, no, I, I do appreciate that you invited me on to do this uh, podcast, Andrew, because I think it is very uh, reasonable for uh, people such as yourself or anybody really to ask, you know, the Society of St. Pius X is at the very least controversial. So uh, there are genuine questions that I think need to be asked. Uh, it's not because... You know, I'm a member of the SSPX, therefore the SSPX is right. Uh, I mean, that would obviously be silly. Right. Um, it's a bit like when people accuse Catholics of saying that the Catholic Church is the true church because that's the church you belong to. But no, of course, the the reason that uh, I belong to the true to the true church is because I believe that it is the true church. It's not true because I believe it, but I believe it because it's true. So in, in, a, in a different way, uh, the position of the SSPX, which is a, a congregation within the church, you could say, um, the position of the SSPX is not that, well, of course we're right, uh, it's us after all, but it's rather that there is a crisis in the church, and what on earth do you do when there's a crisis in the church? And that's, that's a bit where I'd like to start, Andrew, uh, almost like a, a preliminary assumption that if we're going to uh, somebody like yourself or perhaps somebody who's tuning in today who's never even heard of the Society of St. Pius X, and they're, they're saying, well, you know, is there any truth in what they're saying? I think the first thing we have to agree on is that there is a crisis in the church. Because if you and I don't agree on that, then clearly what the Society of St. Pius X does is, is not tenable. Um, right. It's it's just not tenable to say, well, the Society of St. Pius X, you know, uh, sets up priories in dioceses without the local bishop's permission. 
Uh, that's not tenable unless there is, in fact, a crisis in the church. And I uh, would like to just start off by demonstrating, uh, not in the sense of proving, because it's, it's something that's kind of obvious, that there is a crisis in the church. Now, this crisis in the church is not caused by the fact that there is sin within the church, that church members, uh, even uh, eminent ones such as priests, bishops, and popes even, are sinners. Uh, It's not a crisis because there are certain errors going around the church. I think it's always been the case. As St. Paul said, O portet hereses esse, there must be heresies. Uh, That's not the crisis in the church. It's not even that you can look at certain aspects of the exercise of authority in in moral matters and say there's corruption within the church. None of those things is a crisis. Okay, They're, they're bad, but they're not a crisis. The crisis comes from the fact that the Pope and the bishops, uh, by and large, so I'm, I'm not saying every single bishop, uh, but by and large, the Pope and the bishops, in general, do not teach the Catholic faith. And they do not correct errors. They do not watch over the flock to protect the flock from the, uh, you know, the, uh, the wolves that come in either wolves' clothing or sheep's clothing, depending on who they are. But by and large, they do not protect us at all. And rather, uh, the Pope and the bishops, again, by and large, and in general, do teach some error. Uh, they clearly do not do so infallibly, because that would be a contradiction in terms. Uh, we know that the Holy Father when he teaches as the supreme doctor of the church, intending to bind the faithful in a matter of faith or morals, teaches infallibly. Clearly, it's impossible then for the Pope to infallibly teach an error. Okay? So we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is that, you know, casually, in uh, trips on aeroplanes, in uh, sermons, even in official documents, even in very official documents, that the uh, the Pope and the bishops teach error. So in other words, you've got a situation where the authority within the church is not doing its job, and that's a crisis, okay? Because so, okay. let's imagine, you know, you're in some sort of organization. Uh, let's, let's say that the organization is, I don't know, you're on board a ship or something, and you're, uh, you're a sailor on board the ship, and there's going to be things that arise during the voyage. So there's going to be storms, Uh, There's maybe even going to be pirates trying to take over the ship. And none of those things, in a sense, are a crisis because you've trained for those things. You're prepared for them. The crisis comes when the captain of the ship or the superior officers of the ship are not actually doing their job. And that is, in fact, what the crisis is. So that's very important to understand because... In a sense, all crises within the church have been crises of authority in that authority is not doing its job. As the French say, the uh, fish rots from its head. Uh, It's the head that goes first. Um, But this is the fact. And I just want to give a few examples, uh, if if you have time, Andrew, about this. Because, you know, uh, people might say, well, you know, uh, Pope Francis says some good things. And uh, I was just reading some of his... uh, some of his allocutions when he was visiting Africa recently. And, you know, he encouraged people to never cease invoking Our Lady. And I said, wow, well, that's uh, that's definitely a good encouragement. Excellent. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, Pope Francis, uh, you know, says that uh, we should pray often, and that should be the best thing that we do. And this was in one of his, in his talks in uh, Congo, that prayer comes first because the uh, the action of the apostolate um, comes from God, really. And I said, well, that's, uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty solid doctrine there. But then on the other hand, uh, Pope Francis also teaches errors. And these are just a, a few examples. You might remember some years ago, a young boy uh, went to the Pope and said, uh, Holy Father, my dad uh, is dead. Uh, my dad was an atheist. Uh, he died as an atheist. Can he go to heaven? And Pope Francis said, yes, of course he can. Okay, but 
that's not really true. I mean, it's true in the sense that, yes, of course he can if he repented before he died, which would be a true thing to say. None of us can say that, okay, this guy's in hell uh, because we do not right. know what happens at the, at the last moments. God's grace is great. But Pope Francis says, well, good atheists go to heaven. Well, that's not true because in mm. order to, uh, to be saved, you have to uh, believe in God, that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's uh, St. Paul who tells us that. Uh, Re- Pope Francis's uh, uh, message for the, wor- for the day- World Day of Peace there at the beginning of the year, our greatest treasure is our shared humanity. Well, I'm so sorry, our greatest treasure is not our shared humanity. Our greatest treasure is the supernatural life communicated to, to us by Jesus Christ. Or Pope Francis says, the ecological crisis is the greatest crisis facing humanity. Well, it's not. It's sin. Uh, All religions lead to heaven. Well, they don't. Only the true religion leads to heaven. And religious liberty, everybody has the right to practice the religion of his conscience. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the traditional teaching of the church. Uh, You may uh, indeed be, should, it may happen that you have a right to a certain tolerance in the practice of your false religion, but you have no right per se to do something evil. That's what the church is always taught. And so these things uh, are, in fact, errors. Now, I'm, I'm perhaps jumping ahead a little bit, but people might say, well, how does the SSPX get to judge the Pope? Well, you know that over, over the last 50 years of the SSPX's existence, it was founded in 1970, that uh, at various times there were doctrinal discussions between the society and Rome. Now, a doctrinal discussion between the society and Rome does not consist in us showing up in Rome and saying, hey, guys, uh, you know, you got it wrong. We got it right. Uh, you need to uh, you need to tell us, you need to join our position so that, uh, you know, let's have a negotiation. Well, I'm sorry, you do not negotiate with your boss. Okay, you don't negotiate with your dad. You obey your dad. You obey your boss. And so what those doctrinal discussions actually involved was us going to Rome. And I, I know this because um, uh, Bishop de Galaretta was was on the, he's one of the society's bishops. He was on the last uh, uh, commission to discuss these matters, which was around 2009, I think, 2010. And he told me, he said, what we did when we went there is we didn't say you're wrong, we're right. We said, this is what you say about, let's say, religious liberty. This is what the church has always said about religious liberty. Who do we believe? And that's where it lies. It's not us judging uh, Rome or judging the Pope. It's because the faith cannot change. Okay. What was once true as part of the faith is always true. And if it is false now, that means that it was always false. And so what we're simply pointing out, if you like, is that if the Pope says that uh, good atheists go to heaven or that the death penalty is intrinsically evil, well, the church used to teach something completely different. So who do we believe? Of course, that's why, uh, you know, I think it was Bishop Williamson who used to say that the the SSPX is like a bone stuck in Rome's throat. They can't swallow us and they can't cough us up. Why is that? It's because it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about the faith. The faith cannot change. I just want to tell you a few anecdotes uh, from my own personal experience, Andrew, because I grew up in the Novus Ordo. Well, I went to the serve, the, the, the Novus Ordo Mass. And, uh, you know, Good people. There, there are good people uh, in the Novus Ordo, good priests. But this is what happened, okay? So, for example, uh, my mother uh, is expecting uh, a baby, and uh, the the priest says, she's, she's about eight months pregnant, okay? So the priest says, well, uh, next from next week, next Sunday, we're not going to kneel for communion anymore. We're going to stand, Okay, so she uh, comes up for communion the following Sunday. There's a Novus Ordo Mass, and she kneels down. Okay, and the priest ignores her, refuses to give her Holy Communion, and she, being eight, 
months pregnant is stranded because there's no water rails anymore and she can't get up and she's completely embarrassed. Why? Well, because what we used to do, which is kneel for communion, is no longer permissible. Okay, how's that possible? Yeah. How could it be that? Uh, now, of course, there are circumstances where it's okay to stand for Holy Communion. Uh, the priest, for example, sure. stands for Holy Communion, and people who have difficulty kneeling down, we have them every Sunday. Okay, so it's it's not that it's a question of intrinsic. Uh, well, of course, uh, if you're not kneeling down, you're committing a mortal sin. But it's a question of well. How did this sign of reverence for the real presence of our Lord suddenly become unacceptable? Other example. Right. So my, uh, and these were things, if you like, that, that brought our family, uh, when I was much younger, brought our family to the conclusion that something is rotten in the state of Denmark. And what's rotten in the state of Denmark is that the faith is actually being sucked out of you the, uh, because the bishops... And the, uh, those in authority are not teaching the faith, and rather, by their actions and omissions, are undermining it. Other example, so my sister uh, goes to a convent school, okay, uh, confession. So that's a good thing. Uh, the girls are, are being told to go to confession, but they're told, girls, you can only confess one sin. Okay, so that's fair enough. So they go and confess one sin. Uh, my sister comes home, tells my mother, uh, you know, well, that went to confession, we're just allowed to confess one sin. So my mother thinks, well, that's not quite right, is it? So she calls up Reverend Mother, and she says, Reverend Mother, um, I was told that the girls were only allowed to confess one sin. What would happen if a certain girl, hypothetically, had two mortal sins? And the Reverend Mother replies, well, we don't talk to the girls about mortal sin. So... We're telling them to go to confession. Why? There's no such thing as mortal sin, apparently, because uh, we don't tell them about that. Whereas, in fact, mortal sin is deadly to your soul. It hasn't gone away because we're not telling them about it anymore. And right. these are just anecdotes, uh, Andrew. Most people whom I have met in tradition uh, who go to the traditional mass, they, they have the same sorts of things. It's that, well... You know, I was trying to keep my faith in my local parish, but it just was constantly being opposed, told that we couldn't teach certain things. I remember me, when I was stationed in England meeting a, a teacher, and this was, uh, this was not, I mean, to me, unbelievable, but as time goes on, I, I don't uh, disbelieve these things anymore because I've uh, seen too many of them. But, you know, he was teaching a fourth grade class uh, in a Catholic school, and uh, he's telling them about purgatory, okay? Diocesan examiner shows up. That's a good thing. The diocese should be checking up on the religious education. Long and short of it is, he's told, either you stop teaching purgatory or you get another job, okay? So why? He's teaching, you know, eight or nine-year-olds they should pray for the souls in purgatory, and you're saying, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable, Okay, mm -hmm. so that's where the crisis in the church is. It's because the goal of the church, the, uh, the, the Catholic church, is the ark of salvation. It is called Catholic because it's universal. It's for all people of all times in all nations. Okay, so its purpose is to bring men to salvation. And that's why we pray at the end of the traditional Mass with the Leonine prayers for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother, the Church. Why? Because she has to be free so that men may save their souls. And then what's actually happening, and this is, this is uh, something you just, either it's, you see that this is true or it isn't true. Okay, if you think, uh, not you personally, but, you know, if somebody thinks that, uh, well, actually, you know, I quite like the fact that we're not, being teaching kids about purgatory anymore. I quite like the fact that we're turning away from being a, a so-called priest-centered, having a priest-centered liturgy to one where the lay people, in fact, can take over from the priests because most priests are dying out. You know, average age of a priest yeah. in, uh, in Ireland, for example, is 75. Well, you know, if you're 75, uh, you probably don't have, you know, 50 years ahead of you. So what's going to happen when the average age is 85, etc.? Mm -hmm. If you think all that is good, then obviously for you, there is no crisis in the church. And 
I have to say that in fact you're not really a Catholic because uh, the the uh, what is necessary for the Catholic Church is teaching the faith. It is mm-hmm. offering the sacrifice of Christ, which can only be done by priests. Baptism can be done by anyone, but only priests can forgive sins. Only priests can give the sacrament of extreme unction. Priests who are bishops give the sacraments of uh, confirmation and holy orders. It's uh, Christ said to the apostles, you forgive sins. Who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. He said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Do this in commemoration of, of me. And so they sort of uh, move away from what we used to do is not acceptable, it's not envisageable, if it's a matter of the faith of the church. Clearly, in accidental matters, in accidental matters which are not actually uh, essential to the faith, then of course there has always been change within the church, and it would be wrong and disobedient of anyone to say, well, I don't like this particular decision that the Pope has made, so I am not going to obey anymore. And that's why actually the SSPX gets into trouble, not only on the uh, left side, but on the right side as well, when people say to us, well, you use the Holy Week of 1962. Okay, yes, we do. But why do you? Because the Holy Week of 1962 is clearly not as good as the pre-1955 Holy Week. And we reply, well, that may be so, but who are we to say that we should not accept what was lawfully commanded on the church. It's not something which is against the faith. So therefore, we continue with it, even though uh, people say, well, you shouldn't. It's, well, we don't have the the authority to do that. And so you see, uh, right. you see in this situation that if you localize exactly where the crisis in the church is, it's a crisis of the faith because the pastors of the church are not, uh, defending and preaching the faith in general, uh, with honorable exceptions, uh, then we, what do you do? What do you do? Do you just say, well, I have to be obedient. I have to, uh, you know, I have to just say, well, you know, obedience comes first. Or do I say, well, you know, this clearly demonstrates that the Catholic church was not the true church because they're now contradicting themselves and they're saying that what used to be a sin is not a sin, so I'm just going to walk away. And I suppose in a crisis, a crisis of authority, you actually are in a situation where people are going to scatter. And that's what's happened. Uh, our Lord himself said these words just before the passion uh, and the death which he underwent for us. Uh, in a sense, the church is going through the passion as well. So you could quote these words. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed, which is a quotation from the Old Testament. If you strike the shepherd, so the shepherd was struck on Good Friday and the apostles scattered all over the place. So one of them stayed faithful at the uh, at the foot of the cross along with Our Lady and the others scattered. One of them obviously was malicious and uh, he was Judas and the others went all over the place. So in a crisis in the church, people go all over the place. Some have given up. Some are trying to change the faith actively. So the modernists mm-hmm. within the church, and I maybe just explain briefly what a modernist is. Uh, I remember having a conversation on a plane one time. Uh, I was explaining to the per- lady sitting beside me, you know, that the Society of St. Pius X uh, ref- was under the patronage of St. Pius X, who famously condemned the modernists. And she thought that that was actually some sort of Amish or Mennonite thing, that uh, the use of any modern technology would be a bad thing. Well, I assured her that I obviously did not believe that, seeing as I was sitting in an aeroplane with her. But (laughs) modernism is a heresy condemned by St. Pius X. It's called modernism simply because it arose in modern times. Okay, Just like there's a heresy called Anglicanism, which arose in England. Or there's an error mm-hmm. called Americanism because it arose in America. Okay, it's not a condemnation of English people per se, or a condemnation of Americans per se, not a condemnation of modernity per se. It's a particular error that arose in modern times. And what is this error? 
what is the error of modernism? St. Pius X explains it very clearly in his encyclical Pascendi, uh, which was issued in 1907. Incidentally, the same time that uh, Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson wrote his book called The Lord of the World, which is uh, interestingly uh, been uh, encouraged by Pope Francis. He would like us to read this book. He says it explains what's happening in modern times. I agree with him. But in any case, uh, the modernist heresy, he explains, has two aspects. Okay, First aspect is agnosticism. And agnosticism is a technical term, which means that you cannot know reality. Okay, You cannot know reality. I'm looking out the window and I see a tree. Okay, I do not, in fact, know that that's a tree. I cannot know that that's a tree because I am... I am fundamentally incapable of uh, knowing reality. Are we just living in the matrix? Maybe we are, okay? That's agnosticism. Now, you might think if you're a realist like I am, uh, that, well, that's stupid. Yes, well, of course that's stupid, but that's the position of idealism, of uh, conceptualism, of agnosticism. You cannot know reality, okay? Draw from that the conclusion. Well, we cannot know the truth about God, and we cannot know the truth about religion. And so, second aspect of uh, modernism, which is, well, if you can't know the truth about these things, then all religion, in fact, comes from your vital imminence. Okay? Your vital imminence means it's coming from inside of you. It's not coming from the outside, because we can't know any reality. It's coming from the inside. Uh, conclusions, therefore, all religion is true. All religion is true, because all of it comes from my inside or your inside, and neither one uh, is better than the other. Uh, it means that religion can change, because clearly men change. So this symbolism of religion should be interpreted in a new way. And so there is no fixed uh, truth that we have to adhere to. And the liturgy obviously has to change in order to reflect our changed understanding of uh, you know, what's true to us. Okay. Now, this error of modernism, okay, this error of modernism is alive and well. Okay, when people come along and they say, well, the teaching of the church on abortion needs to change, or the teaching of the church on homosexuality needs to change, what they're really saying is, well. Uh, there is no objective reality because we can't know it, agnosticism. And so all religion is from the inside and must adapt to change with the times. Well, I'm sorry, that's completely wrong. It's the, the religion of Jesus Christ was given to us by him, transmitted by the apostles, made known to us by the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church, the magisterium throughout time. It cannot change. And so there are people within the church right now, of course, who are actively trying to do that. And we see this, of course, in the synod on synodality. Okay, the late Cardinal Pell, uh, God rest his soul, who incidentally, um, you know, was ex celebrating exclusively the traditional mass in his last uh, months. But he wrote an article which was just published after his death in the Spectator in uh, in England, and he, uh, he 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 put his finger on what's happening with the synod of synodality. It's we're moving away from the truth and we're trying to subvert a, a new truth that actually we're going to change the dogma of the church on faith and morals. And so uh, some people within the church are trying to do that. And then there are other people who are trying their best to keep their faith. OK, you're in a crisis in the church. Your local parish priest is telling you, no, you can't receive Holy Communion on the tongue. You can't kneel down for communion. Uh, no, you can't go to confession. Uh, again, I'm generalizing because this is not true of all, but it's true of very, very many, uh, that he's telling you that the, the goals of marriage have changed, that it used to be that the primary goal of marriage was procreation. That's not the case anymore. It's, uh, it's uh, procreation and equally, it's the mutual love that all of these, these things, that your good atheists are going to heaven that you have to avoid the sin of, you know, not recycling your garbage, whatever it might be. And you say, well, what do I do? And so you try to keep the faith to the best of your ability. And I'll tell you one thing that all of these people seem to have in common 
uh, Andrew, is that they say the rose rate. Okay, it's the uh, it, they're saying the rose rate. Uh, they're perhaps going to the Novus Ordo, and they're fighting a they're fighting a rear guard action in general in there, because they're constantly having to fight against what's going on in the diocese, what's going on in the parish, and they're keeping sane because they're saying the rosary. And then there are others, because mm. when you're kind of left to your own devices, you tend to follow, you know, your temperament a little bit, okay? So you have others who rush to conclusions, and they become what are called sedificantists. And they say, well, I know what's going on in the church. You know, the Pope cannot teach error, the Pope is teaching error, therefore he's not the Pope. Okay? And so they, they rush to this conclusion, and they, they're a bit like the uh, the people who, you know, they've, they've you know, I, again, I, I'm not trying to condemn, you know, these people because I, I genuinely think that they're they're trying to save their faith. They're trying to protect their faith. But they're they're not acting prudently. They're like people who, you know, who do a little bit of research and then come to the conclusion that I know for sure that X, Y, and Z, and actually they don't really know that at all. And so uh, the these people, I think anybody, I think anybody who in a crisis within the church, you're in the ship, uh, there's a storm coming on, the pirates are trying to board, the captain is doing very weird things. Some of the things are good, some of the things are very weird. And you try your best. Well, I think afterwards you're going to be judged mercifully. I think that uh, that yeah. God is going to to uh, judge very mercifully anybody who sincerely and God can see our hearts. No, no man can see our hearts, but anybody who sincerely tries to keep the faith, try to keep the faith of your family. But the position of the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth is, in my opinion, the only objectively correct position. Okay? So you see okay. how it is, is that I'm not saying that, well, of course, anybody who's not a member of the SSPX or a faithful uh, parishioner of the SSPX, of course, they're evil people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's completely understandable. My parents, for example, they were trying to keep the faith for years in the Novus Ordo. And there are many people, you know, were they bad? Sure. Were they bad people? Um, you know, it's. I'm not saying that, that uh, you know, SSPX, outside of which there is no salvation. What I am saying is, in the crisis, what do you do? Okay, what do you do in a crisis? And I think that Archbishop Lefebvre was providentially raised up by God to do this. Okay, I, I am very confident, in fact, that I, I'm, I'm sure that one day Archbishop Lefebvre will be canonized because a, a canonized saint is someone who's not only in heaven, it's someone who is an example of virtue. And I believe that he gave us the example of a virtue, what to do when there's a crisis of the faith caused by the authorities within the church. Uh, they were... They were doing strange things. He says, well, what do you do? And this is the principle of the Society of St. Pius X, the principle of Archbishop Lefebvre, and it is a very wise principle. He effectively said, well, look, at in a crisis in the church, I don't know necessarily what to think, but I do know what to do. Okay? Mm. And that's very important because what is the uh, – what is what should you think, you know, uh, if the Pope says something which is not true against the faith, what do you think? Like, does that mean he's not the Pope? Does that mean that, uh, you know, that we all have to become sedificantists or, or whatever else? Well, the answer is, I don't have the answer to all of these questions. Archbishop Lefebvre said, the church will make sense of this when the crisis is over. Okay? The church will 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 go through all of these things. I do not have the authority to judge that the Pope is not Pope, for example. Now, the set of Acantists will say, oh, well, it's, it is defined in, uh, by the Church's uh, magisterium that you have to obey the Pope in order to be saved. Okay? So, if you say he's the Pope, why do you not obey him? Reply of Archbishop Lefebvre, well, if you need to obey the Pope, clearly that is 
only in matters which are not contrary to God's law. If the Pope tells me to do something which is a sin, I do not have to obey him. Okay, just like you could say to a child, you know, you have to be good and obey your parents. And if you want to save your soul, you need to be obedient, which is very true. But the thing is that if the parent were to tell the child to commit a sin, then the child does not and must not obey the parent because the parent has no authority to tell the child to commit a sin. And so what Archbishop Lefebvre is saying, just, you know, calm down, calm down. In a crisis in the church, what do you do? And so he gave us a number of, of principles, if you like, that you have to apply when there's a crisis in the church. And the first principle is, in fact, the, the most important, which comes from St. Vincent of Lerins, which was a, a monastery in the south of France. People are quite familiar, or they've perhaps heard at least of this. St. Vincent wrote a treatise about uh, the, the faith, and particularly how to keep the faith in a time of crisis. He was writing after... Mm. Uh, the time of crisis known as the Arian crisis. So that was when the deacon Arius said, well, Jesus Christ is not God. Okay. That was not a crisis. That was a heresy. The crisis came from most of the bishops went along with him and they started persecuting the Catholics and the emperors got involved. Obviously, of course, there's controversy over Pope Liberius you know, he seemingly at least was ambiguous at a certain stage in his uh, profession of the faith. But I know that other historians uh, will justify him. I do not have the uh, knowledge and all of that. But there was a huge crisis because the authority within the church was fading. The bishop in your diocese was most likely preaching that Jesus Christ is like God, Jesus Christ is, you know, close to God, but he's not God, okay? So what do you do? And St. Vincent says, in a crisis, you hold fast to what was always believed everywhere by everyone, okay? So that's that's almost like the golden rule. So the, they come to you and they say, well, did you know that it's no longer a mortal sin to uh, commit adultery, Okay. And you just say, no, I'm sorry, that's not true. Because that is not what was believed everywhere by everybody. Or they come to you and say, well, do you know that um, good Muslims can be saved? Well, it was always true that good Muslims can be saved by converting to Christ. But it's never been true that good Muslims can be saved by continuing uh, to trust and believe in Muhammad. Okay, it's it's never been true. So therefore, I need to hold fast to what was always true. Okay, now, and that is just a, an application of a general principle in crises. If there's a crisis anywhere, something happens, stick to the plan. Okay, so let's mm -hmm. imagine you're waiting for someone. Uh, your friend Bob is going to pick you up at the train station and Bob doesn't show up. You can't contact him. What do you do? Stay where you are. Why? Because that was the agreed plan. Okay. And so the agreed plan of the Catholic faith is the faith is given to us as a deposit by Jesus Christ, transmitted by the apostles. Hold fast to that. Now, this, uh, this is the key principle, and it, it, it uh, explains how the SSBX supposedly judges Rome. It's not judging Rome at all. It's comparing what is different in what is now being taught to what was always taught. And in these uh, circumstances where there is a difference, you have to say, well, we need to hold fast to what was always believed by everyone. Okay, some corollary principles to this, uh, Andrew, and then I'm going to uh, let, you, let you say something. But uh, sure, the sure. A corollary principle is then that if there is a crisis. A crisis, by definition, is not covered by, by, by the law, okay? The, a crisis is something completely exceptional. It may not seem exceptional to us as we've been living through it for the past, you know, 50 plus years, 
but it's something which is exceptional. And in a crisis, all uh, man-made laws may not apply. Okay? So, example, you are driving down the road and uh, suddenly you are being chased by a group of uh, gun-toting drug lords. Okay? And they're coming to kill you. So, question, are you allowed to break some of the rules of the road? And the answer is, well, the law actually doesn't tell you you can. I mean, it may do in certain places, but in in certain other places, it doesn't tell you you can. It's uh, you're going over, you know, 55 miles an hour, then that's it. You're breaking the law. That's wrong. Well, the answer is, well, actually, you can. But is there a principle there? Okay. And the principle is called the principle of equity. Now, this is not the sort of equity that Joe Biden's talking about. It's a different sort of equity, sometimes also referred to as epikeia. And this principle, um, I'm just going to quote from uh, the Handbook of Moral Theology by Father Krummer. So he defines equity as a favorable and just interpretation, not of the law itself, but of the mind of the legislator who is presumed to be unwilling to bind his subjects in extraordinary cases where the observance of his law would cause injury or impose too severe a burden. Okay, that's equity. Now, I've got a very real example of this, uh, Andrew. About 80 years ago, in my hometown, in uh, Cavan, there was a terrible fire in an orphanage. The orphanage was run by the poor Clares, and they had many, many orphans. A fire broke out, and tragically, about... 40 or 50 children died in the fire. Now, the story was told over many years that the reason that happened was the soldiers from the local barracks came to the orphanage and the sisters would not let them in because their rule, obviously being religious sisters, prohibited men from coming into the cloister after a certain time. Okay? So I, I'm not saying I believe that story is true, but what I am saying is that if that was in fact the case, then the sisters did not make the correct judgment in the circumstances. Rather than following the strict letter of the law, they should have uh, gone to the mind of the legislator. So the, the law prohibiting men from entering a cloister is obviously a very good thing. But in the case where there's a fire and we need to save lives, then clearly the legislator does not intend to bind you to that law. Same thing with uh, the law which prohibits lay people from touching the, the, uh, the Eucharist, from touching Holy Communion. In a case where you have to save Holy Communion, you have to save our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament from, let's say, danger or fire, then you go ahead and do it. In fact, uh, Many years ago, the governor general of Quebec uh, lost his life saving the Blessed Sacrament from his private chapel. Uh, Is he allowed to touch the Blessed Sacrament? Well, no. But in this case, you need to move outside of the strict interpretation of the law. And I think that's a very important thing to understand because when you do that, you are not disobeying the law. You are merely, merely, as St. Thomas Aquinas uh, puts it, you are merely uh, seeing that in this case, the law does not apply. That's actually in uh, the Summa Theologica, in the first part of the second part, uh, question 96, uh, uh, article 6. He who in the case of necessity acts beside the letter of the law does not judge the law, but of a particular case in which he sees that the letter of the law is not to be observed. Okay, And this is an important thing because people can get themselves tied up in legalism and they'd say, well, hold on a second. Uh, If you, for example, uh, continue to celebrate the traditional mass, you are being disobedient. And this was said to Archbishop Lefebvre in the 1970s uh, in particular. The disobedient archbishop, he's continuing to celebrate the traditional mass even though it has been outlawed. Well, actually, we're in a case of necessity where a Protestantizing mass 
is being imposed on the church. In fact, the traditional mass has not been outlawed, he said. And so he he continued to act. Uh, Was that the correct thing to do? Yes, it was. Because a third principle comes into play, and this is a principle from canon law, which says that if a law is doubtful, okay, don't assume that the previous law is revoked, but rather you should try to hold to the previous law while conciliating with the new law and then use the general principles of canonical equity etc cetera, etc cetera. in other words if there's a new doubtful law coming on coming in then hold to what you're sure of okay so this is uh, this is a great general principle because it gives you something practical to do the new mass is promulgated it's a new law and what do we do it seems that it's a protestantizing one because there has been removed from the new mass everything uh, which was the according to its architect archbishop bonini everything that was the uh, shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren uh, the uh, the new mass is something which does in fact suck the life out of your faith what do you do well don't worry there is a mass that the church has approved for millennia you can stick to that okay but then you're saying that the Pope doesn't have the... No, we're not saying anything. We're saying that the law is doubtful because it is, in fact, something which is sucking the faith. And we can see this very clearly after 60 years, okay? The new springtime of Vatican II, with all its renewal, and here we are in 2023, where the faith has not been passed on for two generations, at least, uh, where we don't have any more vocations, where people do not believe the faith, where Catholics uh, are considered to be exemplary when they follow in the footsteps of Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, and that's it. Well, in this circumstance, we have something that we can do, which is to hold to what we had. And uh, finally, I would say, just as a final remark on that, is that there is a particular temptation shall we say, for people of an Anglo-Saxon mentality, okay? Now, Anglo-Saxon mentality, basically the English-speaking world, it is that since the 16th century, the uh, the Anglo-Saxon mentality is nothing is above human law. Because in the 16th century, uh, Pope, Hen- uh, Pope Henry, he, he thought he was the Pope, I guess, uh, Henry VIII, <laughs> as Pope Henry VIII says to himself, You know, do you know the way that we used to believe that the Pope was the Pope? Well, actually, now I'm the Pope. Okay, I'm the head of the church. I'm the supreme governor. And if you don't like that, I'm going to kill you. Okay, that was effectively what happened. And then the state, most of the bishops, the apparatus went along with it. And so the principle is clear that actually what is supreme is no longer God's law. What is supreme is whatever the king says. And that's deep within the Anglo-Saxon psyche. Um, And even within, let's say, those uh, English-speaking people who are not Protestants, because we're we're living in the culture. Okay, we're living in the culture. And so we think, well, if the law allows, you know, so-called gay marriage, then the law allows so-called gay marriage. I accept it. I would rather the law did not allow it, but I accept it. Whereas in reality... The truth is that any law which is against God's law is not a law at all. So a law which permits euthanasia, for example, um, this law is not a true law. Or the law which permits abortion is not a true law. Whereas the Anglo-Saxon mentality is, well, hold on a second. If this is the law, okay, the law says that you have to do this, you're doing that, therefore you're bad. Well, you need to actually be a little more, look into it a little bit deeper because, well, what circumstances are you in? Okay. So, for example, you, you'll, know, you'll know this, uh, Andrew, and, uh, you know, parents hopefully all over the world will know this, is that when a child disobeys you, okay, the first question you might ask is, well, why did you do that? Okay. Because maybe there's a reason, right? So, for right. example, you told your child when you were leaving home, you and your, your wife were heading out for, for a meal, and you told your children, hey, okay, anybody comes to the door, don't let them in. You're not to go outside of the house while we're gone. 
Okay. And so you come home and you find the children are outside the house. Okay. First thing to do, don't lose your temper because you don't know why they did that yet. So ask them, right. why did you do that? Answer is, well, there was a fire in the house. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, actually, that was good. See, your children are well uh, job. well trained. They're using equity. They're saying, ah, well, the strict right. law coming from dad is don't leave the house, but I'm now going to assume that dad does not bind me to staying in the house at the danger of death, and so I'm going to leave the house. Okay? So th- that's a number of... Uh, a number of, of things which Archbishop Lefebvre has put into practice, he never, and I guess we'll come to this, he never said, oh, well, I'm the Pope. He never said, well, of course we don't need the Pope. He said, there is a crisis in the church, not judging the Pope, I'm judging his actions. And in the crisis, this is what you need to do. Okay. So those were some great overall overarching principles, Father, and thank you for taking the time to go through that in such detail. Um, I'd like to get into some of the specific, some of the specific allegations or concerns that many, like you said, good faithful Catholics are raising about the position of the Society of St. Pius X, about the status of it, about you know what what the practices are. Um, and I'd like to get into the first part, which is obedience. Um, we just finished with, we just talked about, you know, the obedience of, of a dad telling the kids not to go outside of the house. And yes, that makes sense. Um, but there's one particular case I guess I'd like to hone in on, which is the Society of St. Pius X was suppressed. The priests were suppressed from active ministry. The uh, our Archbishop Lefebvre, at least, was suppressed from active ministry back in 1975. Um, the Pope himself said, you cannot do this. And Archbishop Lefebvre went ahead and did it. Uh, in the previous section, or what we just finished, you said, you know, you hold fast to what is always believed. Well, what is always believed in the Catholic Church is the Pope is the supreme pontiff. He is the monarch. He is the head of the church. He is the vicar of Christ on earth. And what he says goes. And so how was Archbishop Lefebvre not being disobedient when he continued to celebrate Mass and when he continued to ordain priests after Pope Paul VI said, stop? That is an excellent question, uh, Andrew, and I'm very glad that you brought it up because it's kind of at the nub of of the whole controversy around the SSPX. Um, the SSPX was legitimately founded in 1970. Uh, Bishop Charrier of Freiburg in Switzerland erected it as a pious union within his diocese. With the permission of the Bishop of Sion, he, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, founded um, he founded a seminary in a, in the Diocese of Sion in Switzerland. Uh, in 1971, Cardinal Wright, in the Curia, issued a decree of praise of the Society of Saint Pius X. So that, that's an important background. The Society of Saint Pius X was founded up legitimately. Okay, it was not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a so-called wildcat uh, congregation. It was founded legitimately with the approval of the church, and even with a particular decree of praise uh, from Cardinal Wright, saying, "Well, if you want to know how to form priests, just do what the SSPX is doing." Nineteen seventy-one, and then nineteen seventy-five, the society was suppressed. Okay, and. Um, I have to say that, you know, when the Pope tells you to do something, you do it. You don't, uh, you don't sort of say, well, hold on a second, who do you think you are? Uh, the Pope <laughs> is the Pope. And even if what the Pope is telling you to do is unjust, you still do it. And we have examples of that in the lives of the saints. So, for example, uh, you know, St. Alphonsus Liguri. Uh, he was removed as the superior general of the congregation that he had founded because, you know, he was supposedly such a bad uh, person and all of these kind of false accusations. In fact, it's it's uh, something which has happened again and again. The saints, as we know, have, you know, false accusations made against them. Unjust decisions are made. And nonetheless, they 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 say, OK, I'm going to do this through holy obedience. 
And so Archbishop Lefebvre should have done that as well, but he didn't, and he was right to not do it. And that's really the nub of the controversy in the SSPX is, well, how did he think that it was right? And the answer is because he knew that it actually wasn't about him and that the decision was unjust. Now, as I said, the fact that you might think that the decision's unjust, you know, if Father Pagliarani calls me up in the morning and says, sorry, I've got bad news for you, you're being transferred to Phoenix, you know, I may think, well, you know, that's very unjust, uh, but... Uh, no, Father, it's beautiful. Come on, come on down. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? It's probably nice in the winter, but uh, I'm not so sure about right. the summer. Uh, anyway, no. Uh, so it's unjust. Well, that's unfair. Why are you transferring me? Because, you know, for some, some accusation that was made against me, right? I just obey, okay? But Archbishop Lefebvre saw that, in fact, it wasn't about him. And how did he see that? Okay, well, it's because the reason that the Society of St. Pius X was attacked was not because the Society of St. Pius X was doing something wrong, but because it was doing something different from what everybody else was doing. Everybody else was saying, okay, this is after Vatican II, let's change everything. Let's change how we form seminarians. Let's get rid of St. Thomas Aquinas. Let's get rid of the Cassock, Gregorian chant, Latin, uh, moral theology in the traditional sense. Vocations in France in particular were going down very much. French bishops look at Icon, lots and lots of vocations. What's going on here? Ah, he's doing the traditional mass. He's not being obedient. We need to we need to stop it for that. And actually, there's there's a very interesting anecdote which you can read in the life of the archbishop. So this was uh, this was in 1976. So after the suppression, because the suppression uh, the suppression of a pious union is not a very difficult thing to do. And if the bishop suppresses you, you, you go along with it. Even if it's unjust, you would go along with it. But Archbishop Lefebvre saw that in this case, that was not the correct thing to do. And that's actually uh, an application of the virtue of gnome, uh, which I'm going to explain in a second. But uh, um, the anecdote I was going to tell you about, June 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre is in France, in Flavigny, and an envoy from the Vatican shows up and says to him, look at Archbishop, I have a new mass missile. Celebrate this mass with me today and all of your troubles go away. Okay, so what, what's the problem is, well, he's not celebrating the new mass. He's sticking to traditional mass. And he says, well, I can do that because the traditional mass was never abrogated. And everybody says, no, no, it was, you're being disobedient. Okay, fast forward to 2007, Pope Benedict XVI says, the traditional mass was never abrogated. Okay, it's almost like, you know, the uh, some people said three years ago that uh, COVID-19 was a lab leak. And then, no, 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 that was definitely not a lab leak. And then fast forward uh, three years, yeah, it was actually a lab leak. Uh, so it's a similar type thing. It's that, so he, Archbishop Fed was right there which means that him being uh, suppressed because he was sticking to the traditional mass was unjust, okay? That doesn't mean to say he shouldn't obey, but he judged that he should not obey, and he, in fact, has turned out to be correct because if he had not continued doing what he was doing, there would be no traditional mass today. There Now, God, uh, I, I want to put a caveat around that because God clearly can do, sure. he's not He's not bound to, to use any particular means, and clearly God could, in fact, use any means he wanted to uh, to continue the uh, integral teaching of the faith, the uh, traditional mass and sacraments, but he actually used this one. And uh, that is why it's correct. And it's the, the virtue of gnome. I'm just going to quote St. Thomas Aquinas on this just to show that this is actually something which which is real, is that it's not it's not just making this up, saying, well, you're being disobedient to the Pope. It's kind of going back to the situation, uh, let's say, in the ship, where the captain of the ship, in this case the Pope, who's the vicar of Christ, okay, he's not the he's not the invisible head of the church. Uh, he is not God. He has to be faithful to his principle who is Jesus Christ. He's only the vicar of Christ. So the Pope is coming along as the captain and he's saying, okay, well, we're going to do something really weird, such as we're going to uh, accept that, uh, you know, all religions lead to heaven. 
or we're going to uh, accept that everybody has the right to follow whatever religion he wants, or we're going to accept uh, novelties such as the uh, the new change in the goals of marriage, etc. Okay, so in this situation where the Pope is not, in fact, doing his job, and his job is to be the rock. The rock is the faith. Okay, his job is to preach, protect, and guard the faith. Sometimes jokingly, I say to people, look, the Pope's got the easiest job in the world. All he has to do is say, no, this is not what we received from Christ. Okay, <laughs> that's really all that he has to do. It's That's his job. Okay, so he's not doing it. I am simply continuing doing what we always did, okay? And now I'm being suppressed. If it's for me, fine, okay? But, in fact, there's more to this. And this is, uh, in St. Thomas Aquinas, the second part of the second part, question 51, article 4. Uh, you can go and check this up. He talks about the virtue of nome. And you might say, what the heck is the virtue of nome? Well, it's a part of prudence. It happens, according to the saint, sometimes that something has to be done which is not covered by the common rules of actions. For instance, in the case of the enemy of one's country, when it would be wrong to give him back his deposit or in other similar cases. So in other words, somebody is an enemy of your country. He's coming looking for his deposit. He has money that he has deposited in your in your bank or he has deposited his, his gun. Don't give it back. Why? You have to give it back. It's the law. You have to give this back to me. I'm sorry, I'm not giving it back. Why? Because we're in a special circumstance. Hence, it is necessary, the saint says, to judge of such matters according to higher principles than the common laws, according to which Sunesis judges. That's a different virtue, which judges according to the common principles. So common principles, yeah, you just do what the Pope says. Okay? Gnome, we're in a special situation here because the Pope you know, has gone crazy. He, The Pope has gone crazy. He's, we're changing everything. The tens of thousands of priests are, are leaving. We're not teaching the faith as we used to. I'm continuing to do these things. I'm continuing to form priests as we always did. And then we need to suppress what I'm doing. If it were for me, fine. But it's not just about me. It's about something greater. And that's why he made this call. Now, of course, we can argue about that and say, well, he was wrong, okay? And uh, the thing is that when you're in a special circumstance, well, yeah, I mean, it's something you got to make a call. It's it's not it's okay for you or me to sit here in a sense because we're not bishops. We're not archbishops. Uh, we're not saying, well, of course, you know, if it were me, I would have done such and such. I don't have those graces of state. I'm not in that position. And... Uh, People might say, well, what about all the other bishops? You know, who does, he, who does this guy think he is? Well, he doesn't have to answer for all the other bishops. He has to answer for himself. Okay, it's like uh, the the man behind my, uh, my shoulder here, St. Thomas More. You know, they were saying to him, you know, who do you think you are? You know, you're saying that all of us are wrong? And he says, well, look at, if you get sent to heaven for doing your conscience, and I get sent to hell for doing mine, will you come and join me just to be with me? Well, no, you have to be loyal. And the archbishop was loyal. And he said, okay, it's not just about me. It's about the faith. It's about the faith. And that is that's the that is the, the correct justification of doing what he's doing. If you come along, somebody comes along and says, well, it's against the law. Yes, I agree. It's it's against the, uh, the man-made law, the decision of the Pope. Uh, now, I'll put a caveat there as well, because Michael Davies, for whom I have a lot of respect, does not agree with me in that. And he says, well, actually, it was invalid even according to the law. That's possible. I do not know. But in a sense, it doesn't matter. You know the Pope wants you to do this. So uh, so you should do it. But in this circumstance, then he was correct in not doing it. And that's it's just following the general principle that obedience, okay, obedience is a moral virtue, okay? A moral virtue stands in a happy medium between too much and too little, okay? So it's not like a theological virtue, faith, hope, and charity, whereas in a theological virtue, you can't believe God too much, okay? You'll never go wrong if you believe God, you know, to excess. Now, clearly there are ways in which you can 
believe in a superstitious way, that would be different. But right. you, you can't believe God too much. You can't love God too much. You can't hope in God too much. But you can be too obedient. Okay? So if you take the case again of the family, let's imagine my dad, uh, he wants now to become an evangelical Protestant. Okay? He was a traditional Catholic. Now he wants to become an evangelical Protestant. In fairness, he's not forcing me to become an evangelical Protestant. But he's putting in some rules such as, well, no more no more rosaries, okay? Well, you need to obey me because I'm your dad. I'm saying you don't you're not allowed to say the rosary. So what do I do as a child? Am I saying, well, I better obey? Or do I say, well, actually, dad does not have the authority to tell me to do that? And the answer is, you're quite right. D- dad does not have the authority to tell you to do that. You may choose to comply for a greater good. Because you see, Andrew, where there's an unjust law, okay, where there's an unjust decision, you're not bound by the decision as such, but you need to judge which is better for the common good, okay? So if, for example, I get condemned unjustly by a tribunal, chances are it's probably better for me to comply because it's better that I spend some time in prison than there be anarchy in the state by just refusing to to comply. That's the example our blessed Lord gave us also. He complied with an unjust uh, command. He had done no crime, but he chose, I I lay down my life, okay? But in certain circumstances, maybe the thing to do is not to comply, okay, if it's an unjust law. And that's why you have to make that decision. And St. Thomas Aquinas explains that as well, talking about unjust laws. They don't, they don't uh, apply per se, but you need to figure out what's the correct thing to do. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, in fact, figured out that this was the correct thing to do. And he was right. You said that if the, if the un, injustice done against you is not about you, uh, you mentioned that it's it's it was unjust, but it was also not. Um, the archbishop said it's not about me. They're not trying to stop me. They're trying to stop what I've always been doing. Well, it Can doesn't matter. That trying a to stop me more. Sorry, sorry, I, I Andrew, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, and I did not catch the question. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. So you're saying that for the archbishop, it was. He said this. This action where Pope Pius the uh, Pope Paul VI, excuse me, was saying, you know, stop, you're you're, you're not allowed to to um, you know continue what you're doing. Um, the Archbishop said, it's not about me. Therefore, it is it is just for me to continue. It is just for me to disobey that. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more, Father? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so. I, I'm not sure if I expressed myself clearly there. What I meant to say was, if it were just about me, I should comply with a non-just order. That's, that's the example that the saints have given. But Archbishop Lefebvre, using the virtue of nome, by which you see that in a certain case, exceptional case, that the letter of the law is not to be applied because it would, in fact, do much more damage. That And clearly, you'd have to have the competence to decide that, which I do not believe that uh, you or I would have the comp- I, don't, I don't think we would have the competence to decide this. He, being, being a bishop, had that competence, and uh, he saw that it was not about him only, but that it was actually about the mass the traditional mass, which is the protector of the traditional faith. And that is why he was being suppressed. And this was shown by the envoy of the Vatican saying to him, just celebrate this mass and all your troubles will go away. And so that's why he made the call, which was a virtuous call. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, can we talk about the some more of the legal ramifications, the legal existence of the Society of St. Pius X, um, there have been differing opinions. There was one uh, letter that was sent from Rome to one of the faithful saying uh, that you can attend the Society of St. Pius X Mass and use it for your Sunday obligation. There are other letters, there are other articles written, uh, there are other 
uh, statements from the Vatican that seem to contradict this. We have some bishops, archbishops, cardinals who seem to be very, uh, very much on the side, quote unquote, of the Society of St. Pius X. But then we also have um, Cardinal Burke, for instance, who seems to be a fairly good cardinal, all things considered, um, saying that the Society of St. Pius X has no canonical mission and it does not exercise a legitimate um, function within the church. He even said they have adopted a, quote, schismatic position. We'll talk about schismatic a little bit later. Um, but can we talk about the canonical mission? How is it that people uh, like myself can go to a mass offered by you, Father, or a priest of the Society of St. Pius X, when cardinals of the church, bishops of the church have said... It has no canonical mission. It really shouldn't exist. Okay, so that's that's an excellent question. So I, I guess it it all it all comes down to the uh, same uh, principle, really, which is that um, which is that you know there's a state of necessity. There is a crisis within the church. Okay, and the law of the church, which is called canon law exists for the salvation of souls. That's actually the final word in the Code of Canon Law of 1983, that the salvation of souls within the church is the first law. Okay, and so Canon Law actually gives you, in a sense, the tools you need to operate within a crisis because Canon Law is the um, it's, you know, the fruit of centuries of jurisprudence, centuries of experience, because the church has had canons from, from, you know, from day one, from the Council of Jerusalem, you might say. And so within canon law, there is such a thing as supplied jurisdiction. Okay. Now, some of the cases are very understandable. For example, if you're in danger of death, any validly ordained priest, be he good or bad, heretic or uh, faithful, he has the authority, the jurisdiction, to absolve you from your sins. Even to such an extent where if you had a priest in good standing who was close by, you could choose rather to confess to the priest in bad standing because the church wants you to save your soul and so gives this jurisdiction. And in fact, the, um, the, the, the supplied jurisdiction, which comes from canon law, applies in danger of death. And it also applies in case of common error. So this would be a case whereby, for example, you know, imagine a priest shows up uh, to, in a church, sits down in the confessional, and people who are used to going to a perfectly... A legitimate priest, um, imagine that he's the, uh, this is also a perfectly legitimate priest, and so they go to confession. He doesn't have jurisdiction. Canon law supplies it because everybody thinks he does. Okay? Now, there are many uh, ways you could actually uh, explain that better than I'm able to because I'm not a canon lawyer, but that's the general principle. And then the third way is where there's a, a positive and probable doubt of the law or of fact in other words, there's some uncertainty over either the law or over some fact. In that case, don't worry, the law of the church supplies jurisdiction. Now, the, the principle on which the Society of St. Pius X uh, has uh, supplied jurisdiction, it's not on the canon law which tells you that, well, there's common error. Okay, some people would uh, say that, oh, well, the Society of St. Pius X thinks that everybody's in common error. Well, uh, I don't think that that's reasonable uh, to assume that everybody's in common error. I think people coming to the Society of St. Pius X know uh, what they're getting into and uh, where they are. No, rather, there's a principle called uh, canonical uh, analogy, so uh, by which you, in a, in, a, in a situation where all of the uh, canon laws do not specifically give all of the things you need to do in a particular case, that then you have to use canonical analogy, canonical equity, which is you try to apply the laws as best you can. 
very simply that in danger of death, for example, the church supplies jurisdiction. In a, in a case where people are trying to bring up their families in the Catholic faith, where people are trying to have the Catholic faith as always was preached to them, in a case where people are trying to go to a mass that clearly expresses the faith, as opposed to one which occults it or Protestantizes us, well, you can, you can apply that and say, judging by the principle of canonical equity, the church would supply jurisdiction in this case because there's, in fact, a grave necessity. Okay? Now, that does not mean that every individual Novus Ordo priest is sort of a, you know, that he's teaching heresy. I do not say that at all. But in general... In the, uh, in the greater part of cases, your faith is being drained out of you in your local parish. And that's, uh, that's a fact. And, and in, in that case, well, what are we going to do? We have these priests who belong to the Society of St. Pius X, which was suppressed unjustly, but nonetheless have continued because of the situation within the church, because the, uh, the traditional faith was not being taught because the traditional mass was being done away with and the new mass was a danger to souls. And so they continue, then the in those cases, you can assume that the church supplies jurisdiction. Now, in a sense, you know, that's a, that it's a bit of a, that's an important argument, but in a sense, of course, Pope Francis, for reasons perhaps best known to himself, is, is quite favorable to the Society of St. Pius X, and so has, for example, given jurisdiction from himself to the priests of the Society of St. Pius X to hear confessions. Okay? Now, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I am at a bit of a loss to understand from the point of view of somebody like Cardinal Burke to say, well, Pope Francis uh, gives them jurisdiction to hear confessions, and yet they're simultaneously schismatic. I, I don't I don't uh, I don't understand that argument. Uh, obviously, uh, you know it, it, I'm sure there is an argument behind there somewhere. But uh, in any case, you cannot say that our you cannot say that we don't have any uh, canonical mission because clearly Pope Francis has given us this uh, authority to hear confessions. But even if he hadn't, uh, we still had and continue to have in the crisis of the church where souls are looking for and have a right to, in fact, the true unchanging faith and the mass and the sacraments of all time, then we have the jurisdiction according to the provisions of canon law used in an analogical sense. We have the uh, jurisdiction to do that. One other thing that was mentioned recently was the... Uh, topic of canonical tribunals. So basically, uh, in lay terms, that's marriage court or a canon law marriage court. Um, and there's been an accusation that because the Society of St. Pius X sets up their own canonical tribunals, that this sets them apart, that they are operating sort of a separate church or a parallel church in a legal sense. Um, is that accurate, Father? Okay. Um this is uh, an interesting question. Um, thank you very much for bringing it up, Andrew. Um, so, yeah, so a, a canonical tribunal is in fact, um, it, it's a sort of a court. That's what a tribunal is in a sense. It's a court where you judge of canonical matters. Now, I referred earlier to the case, for example, where you're going to have a court uh, to judge a priest. Okay, so priests, for example, who are accused of crimes, um, crimes in canon law, such as heresy, for example, will be brought before a court. And I, I for example, said that uh, Pope Francis had given, I think it was to Bishop Feli at the time, uh, the uh, authority to judge in the first instance. Okay, It's an act of jurisdiction to, uh, to judge in a court or a tribunal. When we're talking about marriage tribunals, the marriage of Catholics is exclusively an affair for the Catholic Church. Now, of course, living in non-Catholic countries, as we do, uh, the civil power 
in fairness, in North America, it's mostly, uh, you know, takes a back seat. In France, for example, the civil power doesn't uh, respect or even give any sort of credence to the marriage within a church. And so you have to go to your uh, to your mayor, the mayor of the city, to get married, uh, which Catholics are forced to do, typically the same day as there is the religious ceremony. But uh, in in principle, the civil power has got nothing whatever to say about uh, Catholic marriages because these are ruled by, being sacraments, they are ruled by canon law. Now, of course, human nature being what it is and uh, all the consequences of human nature uh, sometimes uh, there can be cases where a marriage is not valid. So this would typically take place where there's some sort of error, fraud, deceit, grave fear. You know, I'm forcing uh, Rapunzel to get married to uh, to Bob and Rapunzel doesn't want to. And so afterwards, uh, I need to have some mechanism for judging whether or not that marriage is valid or invalid. Because clearly you can't just say, well, my marriage is invalid and now I'm not living with Rapunzel anymore. Okay. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to prove that because marriage is something which does not just affect me, the individual, or even just my family. Marriage affects all of society. In fact, marriage is the building block of society and is of such importance that society has always protected and surrounded marriage with all sorts of laws, even non sacramental marriage, so among the the pagans. So I assume always that marriage is valid unless proven otherwise. In order to prove it, I need to go to a tribunal. Okay? So this is an act of jurisdiction and therefore comes from, you know, the bishop of the diocese. He is the, the source of jurisdiction within a diocese. He has the power to declare whether a marriage is valid or invalid. Now, note carefully... I'm sure you know this, but perhaps one or other person listening might not know, is that we're not talking about the granting of divorce, okay? That we're not talking about the granting of divorce because divorce does not exist. Uh, it is true that the, the Holy Father does have the power to dissolve marriage in certain uh, circumstances, such as the Petrine privilege, uh, the uh, Pauline privilege, um, the case of a marriage which, uh, which takes place and is not consummated, the Pope does have, in fact, the authority. But these are very rare cases. Aside from that, um, the, uh, when there is no such thing as divorce. Okay. Now, annulment is when you say, well, actually, the marriage was never valid. And this is because we got proof here that actually a couple of Bob's friends showed up with machetes and forced Rapunzel to come to the wedding. Okay, that's grave fear. It's proven the marriage is invalid. Or Bob was already married, so therefore he couldn't get married again. And so that's why you have to have a tribunal which looks at the evidence, proves that it's true, and then gives a judgment. Act of jurisdiction. Now, Post Vatican II, we got a problem. What's the problem? The problem is that we start giving out marriage annulments for reasons that we never gave them out before. Now, this is a tricky territory, obviously, because, of course, the Pope does have the authority to uh, legislate concerning marriage. The laws of the Church concerning marriage are the position, are the um, responsibility of the Pope. And so it's a tricky territory. You're in a crisis. What do you do? There is a principle in canon law in a crisis, which I refer to, laws which may be doubtful because, for example, uh, promulgated with the intention of uh, making it easier, for example, for Catholics uh, to, to uh, get annulments. Certain dioceses, we all know that, you know, you, everybody can get annulment if they, uh, if they want to. And so... The Society of St. Pius X taking a very careful approach based on principles in a crisis, stick to what we had before, which is also what St. Ignatius gives in his Rules for Discernment of Spirits. Before the crisis, before the desolation, you were seeing clearly before the crisis, stick to what you decided then. So it's kind of a principle of prudence. And so the society says, look, at if 
there is, if you go to your local diocese, you may or may not get a judgment based on traditional principles. You may get a judgment based on new and dodgy principles, such as in cases, for example, that, well, the person was immature. You know, he was 25 when he got married, but he was immature. Well, the church has never accepted that as a, as a reason in the past. And so you want to be sure that your marriage is, in fact, annulled based on traditional principles. The uh, marriage tribunal, which is a tribunal of suppliants, it's, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, we're saying, okay, we got the authority to set up these tribunals. It's like a provisional tribunal, given that the situation in the church is what it is. We're, we, having studied canon law, will be in a position to give you a, a judgment that either your annulment, uh, which you got from the diocesan authority, is in fact in accordance with traditional principles, or in the case where those marriages which happened, uh, which happened within the SSPX using the extraordinary form of marriage, are not able to be judged by the diocesan tribunals because in particular dioceses, they do not recognize that the marriage is valid because they say, well, you've got no right to use the extraordinary form of marriage, which is perhaps uh, a topic for another day. But in those cases, I mean, what are we going to do? It's like, well, you know, get back to our home analogy. You know, dad has left the home. Uh, the kids are there. we got rules. Uh, crisis happens. What are we going to do? Just follow the rules? Or are we going to actually say, okay, well, in this case, we need to do this in order to keep things going until dad, you know, wakes up or whatever it might be. And so that's, that's the, uh, that is the justification. But once again, it's all of these things have to be taken in context. Okay. Uh, as uh, Father Rifan said in, in 1988, you know, a text taken out of context is a pretext. You know, people who say, well, you know, this is the proof that the SSPX is schismatic because they got marriage tribunals. Oh, my goodness, they've got marriage tribunals. How does that make them schismatic? Well, because it's an act of jurisdiction. Yeah, but what does the SSPX say about supplied jurisdiction and how uh, using the analogy of the law and uh, canonical equity, that actually in this situation, it is okay. And, uh, you know, I think it was uh, Ariel Sharon was was an Israeli politician. And apparently when he was a soldier, he was kind of like, he'd, he'd sort of go off and do really exciting things, which weren't exactly in accordance with his orders. And when he'd get back, uh, you know, he'd be in trouble. And his, his superior officer apparently to, uh, told the others, look, we're not going to punish him. It's better to have a noble stallion that you restrain than a lazy mule that you can't make to work. And in a sense, that's Archbishop Lefebvre. It's, he's a noble uh, mind who is actually saying, okay, we're in the crisis. We have to face up to this fact. And in the crisis, without veering into the error of, oh, I'm the Pope, or I can do anything that the Pope can do, or he's not the Pope, or we don't need the Pope, or we don't need to obey, these are the things we can logically do using the principles which the wisdom of the church, wisdom of St. Thomas Aquinas has laid out. It's, uh, it's reasonable. And those who would come along and say, oh, you know, uh, you don't have any right to do that. You know, well, just uh, uh, think in the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not just man-made laws. I realize that what I'm about to say falls right into the line of the slippery slope fallacy, but I'm going to say it anyway, okay. um, because I, there's, there, there is a nagging feeling, I think, among some people, um, and I've, I've considered it myself, to be, to be blunt, where, Father, let's say I believe ev everything you just said, and that makes sense to me. Um, so then couldn't you apply the same principle to any number of set of accountants groups that exist? Um, you know, Pope Michael, who uh, had himself elected Pope, uh, by his family in, you know, in Kansas, uh, some years ago. And I, and I think he just passed away. So God rest his soul. Indeed. Um, Indeed. you know, any of these number of people, uh, how couldn't any of them say, well, there is a state of necessity. Yes. Society of St. Pius X, father, you would agree there is a state of necessity. Therefore I'm going to start consecrating these bishops. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where does the line get drawn? Uh, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. It's uh, y when you have a vacuum of authority, everything goes haywire. 
It's uh, so this is almost inevitable. I think that there are north of a 1,500 set of Vicantus bishops in the world. Whether they all be validly consecrated or not, I do not know. But uh, yeah, it's I, I agree. It's it's you're in a situation where uh, the authority within the church uh, goes crazy, and then people are kind of left to to their own devices, and you end up with uh, the situation where you got all these all these things now. God is going to judge what's going on in their minds. People can be very, uh, you know, misled, ignorant, uh, jumping to conclusions, etc. God is going to judge them objectively, of course, to say, well, there's no Pope, so I'm the Pope, or my aunt and uncle have elected me Pope is ridiculous. Okay. Uh, to follow up on that a little bit, um, you're in you're in Quebec, or you're in the Diocese of Quebec, so um, Cardinal Archbishop Lacroix comes to you and says, um, Father Sherry, the church that is under your uh, control at the moment, a society of St. Pius X chapel, it has no right to exist. You should not, I don't want it in my diocese. It cannot be considered a Catholic, capital C, church. Um, therefore, you need to stop. Um, how would you answer him? And, and I guess a follow-up question to that is, how do you father say, or how does a, how does the society of St. Pius X get to be the ones who determine whether or not there is a case of necessity? Maybe that's two separate questions. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in any case, they're, they're linked questions, Andrew. Uh, so if the local archbishop shows up and says, okay, we want you to get out of my diocese. So once again, the instinct of a Catholic in matters where the bishop has competence. What I mean by that is that, you know, if the bishop shows up and tells me you need to stop using uh, yellow toothpaste and start using red toothpaste, then clearly it's just no competence of him to, to, to make that call. So I can just ignore that. But in a matter where he is competent, such as which churches are in his diocese, uh, which priests are ministering within his diocese, then clearly I should obey. Except if the law, the commandment is unjust, and I see that it's not. It's there's something more important, something involving the common good. So it's it's the same uh, principle by which Archbishop Lefebvre judged in 1975. Is that it's not about me. It's about if if I'm going, if I'm leaving, it's so that all the faithful who come to to us, who come to the SSPX, and they come for the faith, they come for the reverence of the mass. They're all going to be, uh, you know, so well, let's get them into the Novus Ordo. And so we're not going to preach the faith and we're not going to have the respect for the Blessed Sacrament. And what am I going to do? Am I just going to abandon these people and say, well, you know, that's it. Bishop has said the bishop is not in his right mind. I'm not talking about our particular bishop right now. I'm just talking in general, of course, is the bishop's not in his right mind because he wants to get rid of what we always had. And what we always had is the faith. And uh, that's why I am justified in not doing that. Now, that's it's, it's like a prudential call, okay? It's not like, well, obviously I can mathematically prove to you that of course I should stay or of course I should go. It's a matter of human actions. And in these circumstances, I should stay. Now... Second part of your question was, you know, who does the SSPX think it is to say that there's a crisis within the church? It's first thing to do in a crisis, consult your common sense. Okay, it's any Catholic can, can say, judge that there is a crisis in the church. Not judge according to what men say, but according to reality. Um, and that's, that's why it's not a particular prerogative of the SSPX. But when people come along to you and they say, oh, it's not a crisis in the church. You know, this is just a, a normal evolution in the beliefs of the church. Well, I'm sorry, it's not a normal evolution of the beliefs of the church to say that actually the Catholic Church is not the body of Christ, outside of which there is no salvation. That's actually uh, a contradiction to what we always believed. So anybody can spot a logical contradiction. 
And uh, that's why the Society of St. Pius X is we're just being loyal Catholics. It's a bit like if you had a family situation, let's imagine once again that the dad's going crazy. That's a good analogy because the Pope, of course, is the common father. And uh, he, he wants to get a new woman. So he's pushing out his wife and then he wants to get a new wife to come in. Okay. So then let's say one child stands up and says, I'm sorry. Uh, you cannot just get rid of my mother like that. That's wrong. And then everybody else says, well, who are you to judge? You know, he's that. He can decide. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sorry. It's 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 not a matter of, you know, uh, me simply judging, making stuff up. This is just a question of fact. It's uh, it's John the Baptist saying, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. You know, who do you think you are off to prison? Well, I'm sorry. It's true. Right, and uh, that's that's the thing. It's 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 not so. In a sense, it's not because the SSPX says it, and I can understand that people, you know, may not be of the same viewpoint as the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth. But there's nothing controversial in us saying that. It is a matter that you can actually just look around and see for yourself. Okay, that's the disobedience. That's the canonical mission section of it. Let's Father talk about uh, schism or. Um, and, and I think there are very few people who would say that the Society of St. Pius X is in outright schism. I think there's enough uh, probably evidence to to say that they're not. Um, but there does seem to be at times a, an argument where people will say, if you're not schismatic father, you're definitely towing the line and you're schismatic adjacent or you have schismatic tendencies um, yep. because you you tell people who come to your sermons, your masses, your in confession and conferences that, hey, sometimes you can't listen to the Pope and, hey, we do not listen to the bishops at all times. The Society of St. Pius X does not make that a secret. Um, so I guess the first question is, or does the Society of St. Pius X reject the Pope um, or his authority? Okay. Um, the answer to that question is very simple. No, we do not reject the Pope, nor do we reject his authority. Um, Schism, well, let me quote St. Thomas Aquinas again, 2239. The essence of schism, according to St. Thomas, consists in rebelliously disobeying the commandments. And I say rebelliously, since a schismatic both obstinately scorns the commandments of the church and refuses to submit to our judgment. Okay, that's the essence of schism, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. That's the sin of schism, which is a mortal sin. It consists in rebelliously disobeying the Pope. Now, you can make this distinction very easily. We all can. Imagine a child who is told to do something, and the child does not do it. Okay, that's disobedience. It's not rebellious disobedience. It's just humans being human and disobeying. And then there's a child who turns on his father and says, I'm sorry, I do not accept that you have the authority to tell me to do my homework. Well, that's rebellion. That's a completely different thing. So the position of the Society of St. Pius X is clear. It's that the Pope must be obeyed, except when he tells you to do something which is either against the faith or against morals or uh, diminishing the faith. Example, uh, Assisi. The Pope says, you know, come with me, we're going to go to Assisi, 1986, and we're going to have all the religions of the world together. We're going to put uh, the pot-bellied Buddha on top of the tabernacle, and we're going to have this pan-religious gathering. Well, I'm sorry, that's against the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Or we're going to have a Pacamama ceremony. Uh, I'm going to kiss the Quran, whatever it might be. I'm sorry, those things are wrong. And so you're not actually disobeying when you refuse to obey when it's something which is against the faith or against morals. And uh, in the case where your father actually is doing some of these things, then you also, in matters of, uh, in matters of where he's, he's actually, uh, you know, let's say, 
to give the other example that I gave of the, the dad who's becoming an evangelical Christian, he's telling you to stop saying the rosary. Well, the reason for that is he wants to undermine your faith. Okay. So in the, in that case, are you being disobedient if you uh, continue saying the rosary? Well, no, you're not. And so that's why uh, the Society of St. Pius X accepts the principle that the Pope is the Supreme Pontiff. He is the Vicar of Christ. He has supreme power under Christ over the Church. But the general rule of obedience is, I do not obey when I'm told to do something sinful or something which undermines my faith. And that's the very principle. So it's not a rebellious uh, scorning of the commandments, as St. Thomas says, is the essence of schism. Canon law defines schism as a refusal of submission to the uh, sovereign uh, pontiff and a refusal of communion with the church. Okay? Take the analogy of the dad who's now got himself a new woman. I say, I'm sorry, I do not agree with this. I do not think that it's okay for you to get rid of my mother and uh, have this new person. So I do not agree. And he says, well, get out there. Okay. So now am I cutting off the rest of the family or is he cutting me off? Well, it's actually, I'm not cutting off anybody. I'm being cut off because I'm telling the truth. And in a sense, the Society of St. Pius X, this uh, bone stuck in Rome's throat, we're not coming along and saying, hey, you guys negotiate with us. Hey, you know, let's talk as equals. We're saying, no, Holy Father, we accept that you are the Pope. This has been shown, by the way, by uh, the uh, constant uh, toing and froing that the Society of St. Pius X has had with the Vatican. Archbishop Lefebvre never refused to talk to J Paul VI, John Paul II, I'm not sure about John Paul I, um, Benedict XVI. Just last year, uh, Father Pagliarani met with uh, Pope Francis. It's not a rebellious scorning. It's, Holy Father, what you're saying now does not correspond to what was always said. So what do we do? Okay? And that's that's why it's, it's not a schism. It's not scorning uh, the commandments. It's not refusing the principle of subjection. The uh, and even you know with with that case, I mean, when when Archbishop Lefebvre did consecrate the bishops, and I guess we'll we'll come to that in a few minutes. But when he did consecrate the bishops, he went and asked the Pope's permission. Yeah, why why would he do that if it was a schismatic? Uh, today, for example, if a priest of the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth is to be reduced to the lay state. Um, we go to Rome and we say, okay, well, this is the situation. Rome deals with it. So how does that, how is that a scorning of the Pope's authority? It isn't. It's, and, it's and does, that, Rome, does Rome it, receive, does Rome receive the Society of St. Pius X in that case? And do they uh, educate or adjudicate that case? So it's, it's an interesting situation is that Rome has in fact uh, given the Society of St. Pius X the, the authority uh, for the superior general to judge in the first instance, okay? Because, because of course, okay. you know, you, you've you've got. Let's let's imagine that there's a, a priest who has committed a crime, okay? Now I'm talking about a crime in canon law, because uh, mm -hmm. clearly, if a priest has committed a crime according to the civil law in the current state of affairs, where uh, the uh, immunity of clerics from the uh, civil law is no longer recognised, then clearly. Uh, he's going to be turned over to the civil power. But let's say he's committed a crime under canon law. Let's say he's committed the crime of heresy. Okay, so last Sunday when I was preaching in uh, Rocky Mountain House, I said that purgatory doesn't exist. Okay, that's a heresy. Now, I didn't say that, obviously, but let's imagine I did. Uh, so I need to be judged. So Rome has given the authority to Father Pagliarin to judge me in the first instance. Okay, mm. so why has he done that? If, if we're schismatic, you know, is, is he, uh, are the right. Orthodox sort of calling up the Pope and saying, hey, can we have some of your authority? Of course not, because they do not actually believe or they claim to not believe that he has the primacy of jurisdiction. So now let's imagine it comes to a situation where I'm adjudged uh, to be guilty of heresy and that the penalty is that I'm to be reduced to the lay state, then Rome will do that. So why why is that? So I mean, those are 
are, are kind of, I mean, Pope Francis himself, you know, he gave an interview with La Croix newspaper on the uh, 9th of May, 2016. And he said, in Buenos Aires, I often spoke with the adherents of the SSPX. They greeted me. They asked me on their knees for a blessing. They say they are Catholic. They love the church. I believe that they are Catholic. So, you know, it's it's okay. In some ways, people jokingly say that this is the greatest argument against the SSPX, the fact that Pope Francis loves us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I can see what you're saying, but uh, the fact is that, you know, if you're all about, well, you've got to do what the Pope says, well, this is what the Pope says. Uh, so, you know... I I, uh, I do not I can't I really cannot understand those who say we're schismatic. I can understand those who say, well, you're being disobedient, because that that's understandable. But there's a whole list of uh, of authorities who say that we are not schismatic. I just quote almost at random uh, here. So uh, you know, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth wrote a letter to the bishops of the world in 2009 about the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth. And uh, he he did not say that the site of Sabaius death anywhere was in schism. He did say that there was a danger of schism. Okay, well, if there's a danger of schism, then that means you're not in schism. Okay, if there's if you're in danger of death, you're not dead. Okay, it's that's the the principle of non contradiction. Um, or let's quote I don't know Cardinal Edward Cassidy. So. Uh, he was writing in an official letter back in 1994, which is certainly going back a long way, but it's after the Episcopal consecrations. And he wrote, it's uh, on May 3rd, 1994, the situation of the members of the society is an internal matter of the Catholic Church. Okay. Our 2006 Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei, uh, writing to the Archbishop of Salzburg, Quote, regarding the faithful who sympathize with the Society of St. Pius X, we must insist that, A, we are dealing with Catholic faithful who, provided they have performed no explicit actions, in no way wish to leave the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, attending masses celebrated by priests of the Society of St. Pius X is not in itself a delict. So it's not in itself a crime and does not bring about excommunication. So it's not a schismatic act. Finally, Cardinal Hoyos, who was the president of Ecclesia Dei Commission, this is on uh, Italian TV Canal 5, November 2005. They, the SSPX, are within the confines of the church. The priests, bishops, and faithful of the societies of Pius X are not schismatics. They have not been excommunicated they are not heretics, okay? So, you know, like, that's, those are just arguments because they say, well, maybe they got it wrong, okay? Maybe Cardinal Burke has it right. But actually, the what schism is, is laid down in moral theology. It's laid down in canon law, and it does not apply to what the SSPX does. Now, we're actually, of course, reproached for that by Sedificantists who say to us, well, you accept that the Pope is the Pope, and uh, you should not do that because if he were the Pope, then he would not be telling us to uh, do these things which are against the faith, such as, for example, going to Assisi. And the answer is, well, I cannot judge that he's not the Pope, but I can judge that such a command is obviously against God's law. Or I can judge that what he's saying is in fact uh, diluting what the church has always taught in a particular matter. So uh, it's certainly not uh, not schism. And Archbishop Lefebvre okay. said, um, this was around the time of the Episcopal consecrations, he said, if anyone breaks with the Pope, it will not be me. Okay? And on the sermon he gave on the day of the Episcopal consecrations, he said, uh, he said uh, in French, he said, loin de nous, La pensée misérable de couper avec Rome. Okay. Far from us be the miserable thought of cutting with Rome, of breaking with Rome. Why? Because that wasn't it. It was that the we're in a very unusual situation. And in this situation, I'm applying the virtue of equity, the virtue of nome. And what we're doing appears surprising, but it is that one case where 
apparent disobedience is in fact true obedience. Just like the child who says to dad, sorry, dad, I do not agree with you getting a new woman, appears to be disobedient, but he's in fact the most obedient. It seems, uh, and I guess we can jump ahead a little bit to the Episcopal consecrations. There are a couple other questions that I'd like to follow up with you on, but since we're kind of on that train, let's go for it. Uh, the Episcopal consecrations seems to be a pretty big deal. Well, it is a big deal. It doesn't seem to be. Yeah, it, it is. It, it is. was <laughs> fairly unprecedented, I think, in the life of the church. Um, so in terms of a priest being validly ordained, even if he is outside of the normal structure of the church, he still has the ability to say mass. And a faithful can, and, and a person can go to that priest and have their sacraments, uh, receive the sacraments from him, supply jurisdiction. That all seems to make sense. But consecrating other bishops against the direct will of the Pope when it is within his authority to, to say no, uh, that that seems to be a much higher bar to cross. We know the story. It's you can go back in the crisis in the church series. We we talked to Bishop Fillet about this, and he gave the firsthand account of it. Uh, but in brief, Archbishop Lefebvre went to the Vatican, said, "Can I consecrate bishops?" They said, "Yes, but wait." Archbishop Lefebvre said, "I think you're trying to basically stall me out. Wait for me to die." I mean, he didn't say that, but that was the assumption. And he went back and consecrated bishops. The Vatican sent emissaries the day before or the morning of and said, stop, don't do it. And he went ahead and did it. That seems to be a pretty big deal. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Absolutely. This is uh, this is a big deal. And if you accept, and I understand that everybody listening to us may not accept my argumentation. Uh, I completely understand that. But if you accept that, in fact, uh, what Archbishop Lefebvre did in 1975 was... Uh, an act of the virtue of gnome, which once again is to see, perceive that particular case where the law, the human law, does not apply. Clearly, God's law, the the, uh, the divine law, uh, is not something that we can willy-nilly dispense from. Okay, I can't adjudge that because my neighbor is playing rap music at three o'clock in the morning that I'm actually dispensed from the fifth commandment and that it's okay for me to kill him. <laughs> Uh, that's just not a thing. Okay, that's God's law, and there's there's no dispensation from it. And that's why people who argue that, well, in certain circumstances, you know, it's okay to commit adultery, abortion, etc., they're talking through their hats. It's uh, these things are God's law, but in human laws, there are always exceptions because humans cannot envisage every possible circumstance. Okay, that's why there are exceptions in human laws. That's why any commandment of the church, any commandment of the church, as opposed to a commandment of God, any commandment of the church has exceptions. Okay, I have to uh, receive Holy Communion once a, once a year at Easter time. Okay, uh, let's imagine I live in the Arctic Circle and I can't get to a priest at Easter time, then. I am not committing a sin if I do not receive Holy Communion, okay? Uh, and this is, these are human laws. So if you accept, and it's, it's, it's an if because you may not accept, but if you do, that Archbishop Lefebvre actually did the correct thing in discerning that what was at stake was really the continuation of the preaching of the integral faith and of uh, the traditional mass and sacraments, without all of the conciliar novelties that he was correct, then the logical conclusion is that he was also correct at the time of the Episcopal consecrations, if you accept. Because the situation, in fact, had not changed, but got worse. So before I get into that, um, to, see, to, to show why he was right in doing the consecrations, I want to first of all uh, make it clear that the Episcopal consecrations were not per se a schismatic act, okay? And the reason I know that is because, uh, first of all, it's not listed as one of those acts uh, which are schismatic in canon law, okay? So that's, that's, a good, that's a good reason. Secondly, because it's not per se a schismatic act because the law which requires the Pope to authorize the consecration of bishops 
is in fact a man-made law and was not always the case within the church. Okay, just going to quote briefly, Andrew, if you'll allow me, from the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, Article Bishop. Until the 6th century, the clergy and the people elected the bishop on condition that the election should be approved by the neighboring bishops. Okay, well, I could go on, but you get the point is that the Pope did not always uh, choose and approve in advance what the bishops were. Now, I am not arguing that, well, because we used to do that, then, of course, it's okay to do it. I mean, that's nonsense. That would be the archaeological argument of saying, well, whatever happened in the third century must be perfect. Okay, that's a, that's a silly right. argument. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not because you're living in, uh, you know, in such a century that things are better in a particular sense. Okay, that's the, I call that the Justin Trudeau argument. In 2015, he was asked, well, why is your... Uh, why is half of your cabinet women? And he replied, because it's 2015, okay? Which is a bit like saying, well, right. you know, the reason why I killed my neighbor was because it was the 1st of March. I mean, it's just not an argument at all. And in fact, in his encyclical, Apostolorum Principis, uh, Pius XII points this out. He says, we are aware that those who thus belittle obedience in order to justify themselves with regard to those functions which they have unrighteously assumed, that is bishops, he's talking about bishops who became bishops without a papal mandate. Situations in China, okay? In China at that time, Pope Pius XII is reacting to those who are becoming bishops without the Pope's approval because the Communist Party is trying to get involved and control the church. Some things never change, it's still going on today. So we are aware that they belittle obedience to defend their position by recalling a usage which prevailed in ages past. Yet everyone sees, says the Pope, that all ecclesiastical discipline is overthrown if it is in any way lawful for one to restore arrangements which are no longer valid, because the supreme authority of the Church long ago decreed otherwise. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that this is of ecclesiastical institution. Okay, the Pope is saying... You have to follow the discipline of the church because I am the supreme pastor and I lay down the law. Okay, And in fact, in order to make it clear how serious this was, the Pope changed the penalty, Pope Pius XII changed the penalty for the consecration of bishops without an Episcopal, uh, without a papal mandate. So before that, the penalty was suspension. Okay, I'm a bishop. I consecrate you without permission from the Pope, I am suspended. I'm not excommunicated, I'm suspended, okay? The Pope says, this is getting out of control in China. Now, from now on, you're gonna be excommunicated, okay? What does that show you? Well, it shows that it's not something which automatically uh, excludes you from the church. And it shows you also that it is something of ecclesiastical institution, therefore it's a man-made law, okay? Now, confusion comes into all of this because of Vatican II. So Vatican II in Lumen Gentium uh, makes a, a no, uh, brings in a novelty, okay? And the novelty of Vatican II is that Episcopal consecration um, gives you the uh, munera, so the munera of order and jurisdiction, okay? You know that the, the triple power of the church is to teach, to rule, and to sanctify, okay? So... The traditional teaching of the church is that when you are consecrated a bishop, you receive the power of order, which is to sanctify the sacraments. Uh, when you are given the authority by the Pope, without intermediary, Pope Pius XII says, because Pope Pius XII actually spoke about all of these questions. And he clearly said, I think it was in Mystici Corporis, he clearly said um, or it may have been in the, another encyclical concerning the Chinese issue. But in any case, I don't have the reference in front of me, but in any case, he, uh, he said that jurisdiction is given by the Pope to the person who receives it without intermediary. In other words, the Episcopal consecration is not necessary per se. Vatican II says, no, no, when you're consecrated a bishop, you receive jurisdiction. Not the exercise of it, but you receive the... the uh, the, the root of jurisdiction, okay? And this is a complete novelty. 
Okay, and so much so that you know traditionally, uh, you for example, if you were elected pope, you know that any baptized Catholic can be elected pope. Any man, male uh, Catholic, can be elected pope. So let's imagine you or I were elected pope. Neither of us are bishops. Well, according to the traditional uh, theology of the church, we would become pope immediately. Okay, as long as you're a cleric, the clerics have to. Uh, clerics are those who were able to exercise jurisdiction within the church. And it was the case, for example, for Adrian V. So Adrian V was elected on the 10th of July, uh, 1276, and um, he was not a bishop. And he died on the 18th of August of the same year, and he had not become a bishop in between. But he was the pope, and he is known to us as Adrian V. If I'm not mistaken, the last uh, non-bishop to be elected was Gregory the Sixteenth in eighteen thirty? He was not a bishop. He was elected pope, and he was accepted as pope before he became a bishop. Now, I may be, uh, I may have got my popes mixed up there, but uh, certainly that can be checked. Uh, Vatican II says no, no, no. The whole idea of collegiality, all the bishops uh, by definition exercise uh, jurisdiction collectively within the church. You get it by consecration. And so the, the the idea can come around in certain people's heads that, okay, well, Vatican II teaches that if you become a bishop, you have jurisdiction. Therefore, Archbishop Lefebvre created a schism because he gave jurisdiction. But Archbishop Lefebvre did not give jurisdiction. He was very clear about this. He was saying, if I were to give jurisdiction, then indeed I would be setting up a par- parallel church. But he didn't. He said, uh, and it's right there in his um, in his sermon on the day of the consecrations, is I am not setting up a parallel church. These bishops are not actually going to, uh, you know, become bishops of particular areas. I am consecrating them so that they will, in fact, continue to transmit the Catholic priesthood to give the sacrament of confirmation in accordance with the traditional rite with chrism made from olive oil, as opposed to what most bishops were doing at that time, which is to use chrism made from peanut oil or something like that. And that's why I'm not giving them jurisdiction. And the confusion comes in because of the error of Vatican II. And uh, I can see where the argument is, well, he made bishops. And I guess in some sense, that's the difference between Archbishop Lefebvre and the set of Vicantists, uh, one more difference is that, well, you know, if there's more than 1,500 set of Vicantus bishops, Archbishop Lefebvre is acting prudently, saying, okay, uh, there's, I'm consecrating four. Okay, and there have been, well, there was one more consecrated by the society in 1992. Uh, that was uh, Bishop, um, God rest his soul now, but his, his name actually escapes me. He died about 10 years after that, uh, but in Campos, in Campos in Brazil. Uh, it was the uh, the successor of uh, Bishop de Castro Mayer, not as the uh, territorial bishop of Campos, but as the head of the priestly association of traditional priests. And uh, he, he was consecrated by uh, Bishop Tissier, but that's it. Okay, so it's not, it's, well, it normally, this does not happen. Normally, you do need the permission of the Pope for a very serious reason, for a very serious reason. But in these circumstances, because it is a man-made law, there are situations where you can, in fact, go beyond the man-made law, principle of equity and the principle of gnome, they apply. Okay, so... Why did Archbishop Lefebvre do the consecrations? Okay, now Archbishop Lefebvre did the consecrations. As I mentioned, he did ask the Pope's approval and uh, he judged nonetheless that he should proceed without the Pope's approval, even though Pope John Paul II uh, was apparently ready to uh, permit one bishop. But Archbishop Lefebvre said that he had a sign. Okay, now... If I were to come out now and say, yeah, well, Archbishop Lefebvre had a dream or a vision in which uh, St. Michael the Archangel told him that he should do the consecrations, then you would be well justified in saying, well, you know, how do I know if that's true? You know, it's a bit like uh, the Palmer de Troia sect. When Paul VI died, 
you know, St. Michael the Archangel allegedly appeared to the priest, whatever his name was, and told him, you're the new pope. And unfortunately, that, that sect is still going to this day uh, to the damage of yeah. souls. But no, the sign was Pope John Paul II convoked this prayer meeting in Assisi, which all the religions of the world, all of which are false, except the Catholic religion. Okay? Now, we've got some sort of... Uh, non-Catholic listening in at the moment to say, well, how can you say that? Well, it's very simple. It's because the universal church, Catholic meaning universal, is the one founded by Jesus Christ. In order to save your soul, you must be united to the Savior, and you're united to him by baptism and by faith. And these things the uh, unite you to the body of Christ, which is the Catholic church. Okay? So that's why it is the one true church. And all the others are false. Okay, if you've got one true church, the corollary is all the others are false. So if I, as a Catholic, were to get together some people who are not Catholics so that I could perhaps try to tell them the truth, uh, try to preach to them, as is my mission, go uh, preach the gospel to all creatures, etc., well, that's a good thing. But if I say, no, let's all meet together and we'll all pray in accordance with our own religions, even though all of your religions are false— and therefore, your worship is, in fact, despite the best intentions you may have, your your worship is, in fact, schismatic, heretical, uh, very, uh, very evil in the case of, let's say, those who actually were worshipping the devil, such as the snake worshippers, etc., animistic religions. Well, that's a sin against the first commandment. It's a sin against uh, the first commandment because I am actively encouraging people to worship false gods and... I'm also giving the impression that it's okay to do so, so it's a scandal, and I'm also encouraging people to the sin of indifferentism. Indifferentism meaning that all religions are good, all religions are equal, which comes, of course, from modernism, really. Um, so uh, so that was the first sign. Well, the Pope's doing this. That means he's not in his right mind. This is not what the successor of Peter should be doing. Okay, Peter, when he was preaching Christ, he said, there is one name given under heaven by which we may be saved. And uh, he rebuked the, uh, the Jews who had uh, cooperated with the killing of Christ. And he said, this is it. If, uh, if you want to be saved, you confess the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's Peter. Uh, John Paul II, successor of Peter. That's what he needs to do. He's not doing it. Second sign, none of the bishops react. Paul rebuked Peter when Peter was to be blamed, okay? So that's uh, the case where Peter was uh, imposing the Mosaic law, and Paul says, I rebuked Cephas, the rock, Cephas, to his face because he was to be blamed, okay? If the Pope is doing something which is uh, wrong, then it's the duty, in particular, of his brother bishops to say, Holy Father, this is wrong, okay? Okay. Of course, we know that Cardinal Ratzinger was not in agreement. Uh, Benedict XVI at the time, Cardinal Ratzinger, was not in agreement with this. But, you know, he, he went along with it. And that was the sign. Archbishop Lefebvre says, well, the authority within the church who should normally give me permission to consecrate the bishops to continue to ordain these priests, I'm going to die, to continue to ordain these priests, to continue to have these priests who will preach the integral faith, the authority is morally inaccessible because he's not listening. He's off with the snake worshippers and the Buddhists in Assisi. And uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was never disrespectful to the popes. He was never sort of uh, coming along saying, well, Votia says this and Votia says that. He was respectful, right. your holiness, holy right. father. Uh, but no, he was he was a man. And I think in a sense, that's why Pope Francis respects us, uh, the SSPX in a sense, because, you know, we, we treat him with respect, but we're also very frank and clear with him and say, Holy Father, you know, this is not okay. And uh, he respects that in a strange sort of way. And that's why it was in fact justified to go beyond the man-made law. I know there are some who say, well, no, 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 this is a divine law, but that does not hold up to scrutiny at all. Because if it were a divine law, then the Catholic Encyclopedia would not be saying that it wasn't happening before the 6th century. 
and uh, Pope Pius XII would not be saying that it's a matter of ecclesiastical discipline. Um, so it's it's a man-made law, and so he went beyond and above the man-made law for the good of souls. And once again, it's this very surprising uh, behavior, but to quote Evelyn War, the saints do the most surprising things at times. And, uh, you know, nobody thought that Simon Stylites would be on the top of a, a column for 20 years. Uh, it's not because you do something weird that it's certainly necessarily good, okay? Right. Uh, in fact, the Roman martyrology mentioning the Feast of St. Simon says that he did things that were quite strange. And you can certainly say that being on top of a pillar was quite strange, but uh, if that was the right thing to do, it's not a sin. In a sense, us looking at the archbishop saying, could I have made that decision? I think only a saint could have made that decision. Only a saint, I don't think that... I don't think that, I'm not going to speak for you, Andrew, because I know you're you're probably a saint. But uh, for myself, you know, would I have had the courage to make that decision? I I wonder. I wonder. I mean, it's it. But I think that was absolutely the correct decision, and time has vindicated it. And those who said it, well, it's a schismatic act, they weren't looking at what was going on. They weren't looking, saying, no, no, he's not rebelliously scorning the commandments of the church. He's not setting up a parallel church. And of course, that's why those uh, authorities I quoted from Ecclesia Dei, Cardinal Hoyos, um, Cardinal Cassidy, and even, of course, Pope Benedict, when he lifted the putative excommunications in 2009, it shows, well, no, it wasn't a schism. It, I, have, I have two more questions or two more things I'd like to chat with you about, and I know we're already past two hours, so I appreciate your... Your stamina, Father. Thank you no, so much. No, thank you for the thank you for the um, opportunity, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you were talking about how the Archbishop was never uh, disrespectful, but he did call at one point or another, and I don't know if this is a mistranslation, something from French to English or not, but he did refer to the new Mass as a bastard rite, um, and that is a, a quote that's widely attributed to him. And I think he said it in a sermon. Um, so I guess I a couple questions on this is, first, is the new mass valid? And if so, how could he refer to it that way? And then the follow-up question is, how can the Society of St. Pius X tell people to not attend the new mass? This seems like a violation of the third commandment, Father. Okay, uh, excellent questions. Uh, you're absolutely right, Andrew. Archbishop Lefebvre did refer to the new mass as a bastard rite, and he did refer on one occasion uh, to the authorities in Rome as antichrists. Now, there is a, there is something to be said here regarding translation, because if you uh, look at the French language, so the French language does not really have the same sort of bad language that we have in English. Uh, in other words, it certainly does have bad words, but they do not have the same right. force as they do in English. Okay, so when he said it was un rite bâtard, it's not as shocking on the French ears as it is to us as we hear it in English, because what he what he meant was is that well, uh, uh, a bastard is somebody of illegitimate descent. In other words, there's there was something wrong in that person's uh, coming about in that person's conception and that's what he meant so it's it it was not it was more uh, in, in french it's more like a technical term rather than an insult okay okay so it was not meant to be insulting and uh, as far as i'm aware it never created a sort of a controversy within france um within the french-speaking world but that's what it means and what he meant by that is that it's a uh, it's of illegitimate descent because the new right was brought about by Archbishop Bognini for the purposes of occulting what was specifically Catholic about the Mass. Because the rites of Mass are, are from our Lord Jesus Christ in the essence of the Mass, and then the rest of the rite of Mass comes from either the apostles or their successors or of later ecclesiastical institution. Because you know that the rites of the church are not limited to the Latin Mass. 
Okay, the uh, the, right. the the Catholic Church is consists of East and West. We as Roman Catholics belong to the Roman uh, Church, which is one of the five patriarchates within the Church. Okay, there are five patriarchates within the Church. One is in the West, and that's Rome. And we belong to that particular church. And that's why in our calendar, for example, we celebrate the feasts of the Roman saints like it's nobody's business. Okay, so we we celebrate the feasts of uh, the patrons of Rome, St. Lawrence, for example, the second class feast, the uh, Cathedral of Rome, the Basilicas of Rome, the Roman virgins. You know, it's uh, like how many, you know, how many Irish saints do we celebrate? Well, none. Uh, it's we're Roman Catholics, okay? Uh, I'm not even going to mention the American saints. Uh, the the Roman Catholics, it's it's part of our right. But there's also the Eastern part of the Church and the patriarchates of Antioch, uh, Alexandria, uh, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, and they have different rites of mass, okay? They do not have mass in Latin like we do. And are these rites good or bad? Well, they are good. Why? Because right. The rite of Mass consists of the essence which comes from Christ, the Last Supper, when he took bread and wine. Uh, the ordained priest, he being the eternal high priest, ordained the apostles' priests, do this in commemoration of me. And then uh, later on, obviously, as the Father sent me, I send you, etc. So ordained priest, words of consecration. This is my body, this is my blood, and the intention of the priest, the intention to consecrate. If I, as a priest, uh, uh, I'm simply reading the gospel and I say the words, this is my body and this is my blood, obviously I do not have the intention to consecrate. So I do need the intention in order to bring about the sacrifice of the mass. Okay? Now, this is the essence of the mass and all the other parts of the rite of the mass are there to express the hidden reality and to prepare us for the grace of the mass. Okay, so, uh, for example, the first part of the Mass, the Mass of the Catechumens, is a preparation for the sacrifice of the Mass. The Orphitry is uh, a preparation for the sacrifice of the Mass. And the words and the actions are there to express the hidden reality. But in the new Mass, which is this strange animal, because we're suddenly going to confect a new rite, supposedly based on what was done at the earliest times. Um, and uh, in reality, those things from the earliest times were chosen, which suited a particular purpose. And the particular purpose was, according to Archbishop Bonini, who was head of the commission, which created the new mass, the purpose was to remove what may be the shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren. Okay, you can read that. Uh, he was referring in that particular instance to reform of the prayers of Good Friday. But it's in the Osservatore Romano, March 19th, 1965. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to remove from the Mass what's an obstacle to unity. Because the whole purpose of Vatican II, you know, I always laugh when people say, oh, you're, you don't ex you're schismatic because you don't accept the definitions of Vatican II. The whole purpose of Vatican II was not to define anything. Every time in Vatican II, especially in the first session, when the bishops, like the hardline bishops, came along, uh, like, well, obviously, Archbishop Lefebvre, but also Cardinal Otto Vianney, um, the, the other, uh, you know, hardliners, like, their names are escaping me right now, but you can read it in the history of the council. They came along and said, no, we need to define things. We need to put out the doctrine. And all the time, they're, no, 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 no. This council is a pastoral council. We're just trying to uh, express the faith in a better way. We don't want any definitions. Okay? And then afterwards, they come along and say, oh, you don't accept the definitions. What definitions? We didn't want to have any definitions. Right. And of course, Pope, Bias, uh, Pope Paul VI uh, intervened at a certain stage to clarify that only those things in the council, which were you know, said to be, let's say, infallible definitions, were infallible definitions, that each thing was to be interpreted in accordance with the uh, the theological note, which seemed uh, adequate. So don't assume that it's sort of defining things, that it's not defining. Anyway, to cut a long story short, the council says, let's let's open up everything, aggiornamento. Let's, uh, you know, make everything accessible 
Let's bring about the union of Christians. That's what the new mass is trying to do, to remove from the mass what expresses what is unacceptable to our separated brethren. Our separated brethren are the Protestants. What is unacceptable to them is the mass as a sacrifice. What is unacceptable to them is that uh, the real presence is a thing. And so you remove from the, the rites of the mass what causes a scandal. And so you turn around the altar. Uh, previously, the priest and the people faced God together. Okay. I always get a laugh when people say, oh, the priest used to turn his back on the faithful. No, the priest and the faithful faced God together. And so let's turn it around. Let's use the vernacular language. Uh, let's remove those prayers of the offertory that express the sacrifice. Let's remove most of the genuflections. Let's make the consecration uh, you know, more ecumenical by removing the genuflection after the words of consecration, but only have that one after the elevation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's what he means when he says that it's a bastard rite. It's one of of uh, very dubious uh, origin, one which was uh, you know made up in order to to achieve a particular political goal, which was let's have ecumenism, and one which in fact did not express clearly the Catholic truth. So so that's really what it means. I know the word may sound shocking to us, but of course there comes a certain time for straight talking. Okay? It's but it's not it's it's not a it's not an insult and it's not in in any sense a judgment on those priests and faithful who are in the immense confusion trying to remain faithful. You know it's not it's not because you know, such and such a priest said the Novus Ordo that now he's damned to hell. It's every man has to right. to see what he's going to do in in the in the uh, to quote Saint Thomas More again. He has to work in the tangle of his soul to figure out what he has to do. But uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was correct in my view because the traditional mass is the bastion of the faith. Quick historical anecdote here. But when uh, Luther was trying to bring about his new religion, the ruler of his territory was Frederick III of Saxony, called Frederick the Wise, though he was not very wise. But Luther says to Frederick III, he says, unless you suppress this mass, all of our preaching will be in vain. In other words, all the Protestant preaching is as good as you want. Unless you get rid of the mass, it won't have any effect. And that's, in fact, what has been happening after uh, Vatican II. It's, it's, it's not just that there's a sort of a new belief, but it's also you have to have a new mass to go with the new belief, an ecumenical mass, if you like. And if I could just touch on the Antichrist thing, because uh, in his declaration of November the 11th, uh, 1974, uh, the, uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken... It was in that declaration that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was quite uh, severe on Rome, saying that Rome was modernist Rome. Uh, Rome was, uh, uh, and that the authorities in Rome were antichrists. Actually, no, I'm mixing it up. Modernist Rome was 1974. It was before the consecrations that he wrote that the, uh, the positions of power in Rome being occupied by antichrists. Which seems pretty shocking because, oh my goodness, he's like Luther, he's like Calvin saying that uh, the uh, old Red Sox, as the Presbyterians call them, is in fact the Antichrist. Again, it's a little bit lost yeah. in translation here because in French, there's actually two different words. One word is with a capital A, and that is Antichrist, and that refers to the historical figure who will come before the end of time. And then anybody else who is uh, considered to be fighting against the work of Christ, whether uh, deliberately or through ignorance, you can call, an, with a small a, Antichrist, A-N-T-E, forward accent, Christ. And uh, this is, in fact, what he said. So again, it, it doesn't shock the French ear in the same way that it would shock us, but that, in fact, is what he's saying, is that the authorities in Rome are working 
this is 1987 after Assisi, they're working to stop the social reign of Christ. They're working to remove Christ from society. Therefore, they're doing the work of those who work against Christ. So, you know, we, we could maybe, uh, with, uh, with hindsight, we could maybe say, well, maybe those words were a bit strong, possibly. I mean, you can say the same thing about a lot of the things St. Jerome said, uh, for example, well known for his strong words. Uh, it's, it's, that's a matter of, of argumentation, but that's what he meant. And uh, it, all of his, you know, we don't, let's not fall into the Protestant trap of, you know, isolating one text and then forgetting about all the rest. Let's take all of the things that the Archbishop said and did in context. The your, society your does question, say, Andrew? though, that, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, the society does say, or at least it seems to be the official position of the society to not attend the new mass, uh, which is valid according to the arguments of the Society of St. Pius X itself. So how do we dare to tell people that they have no obligation to attend the new mass? That's really the question. Correct. And uh, that's a very fair question because, you know, who the heck do we think we are? Surely the Pope has the authority to bring about a new mass. And I say, absolutely, because the Pope is the vicar of Christ. And so why do you, you know, people could ask me, like, why do you uh, reject the new mass, you know, just because it's in English or because it's, uh, it's uh, got new elements to it? And I say, none of those things, okay? We have no right to reject a new mass, uh, except if that mass, in fact, does not express the, tr- the reality of the faith. The new mass is ambiguous, okay? It's not a radical it's not heretical. It doesn't express clearly any heresy, but it's ambiguous. So you, for example, turn the altar around. Well, does that mean that we're now offering a sacrifice to God or we're not offering a sacrifice to God? Who knows? You can interpret it as you wish. Or so we're now having communion in the hand. So does that mean then that we still believe in the real presence or we don't believe in the real presence? Well, you can interpret it as you wish. Or in the case of the consecration, So before, the priest used to utter the words of consecration and immediately adore, and then show to the people. Now in the new mass, the priest utters the words of consecration and immediately shows to the people, and then adores. So do you believe then that the words of consecration bring about the transubstantiation or the faith of the people? Well, it's ambiguous. You can kind of make it up as you want. You take out words from the prayers of the mass concerning the sacrifice, not all of them, words which express the, uh, you know, the firm belief in the necessity of uh, penance, reparation, uh, the existence of hell, intercession of the saints, not all of them, but a lot of them. Well, what do you believe? Well, it's ambiguous. So that, that's the thing is that what the new rite of mass is not doing, which all the other rites of mass do, the Roman rite, like all the Eastern rites, is they all express the hidden reality. The new rite of mass was made to not express the hidden reality very clearly, but to make it smudged over so that our ecumenical brethren could also accept this, which, of course, some of them did. There were six Protestant pastors on the commission which uh, which uh, worked on the new mass. I don't know exactly what they were doing, but they were there. Uh, Brother Roger of Teze famously said after the new mass came out, said, this is cool. We can now worship with our Catholic brethren. So it's, it's, it's ambiguous. So what the Society of St. Pius is not saying, hey, you know, don't listen to the Pope because he's not the Pope. No, what the Society of St. Pius is saying, and it's always back to this principle, it's that we're in a situation where the, the, the boss is not doing his job. He's doing something pretty uh, serious. That does not give us the authority to do whatever we want, but it does give us the authority to use the virtues of equity and gnome, as we explained, and to go beyond the strict letter of the law and to see that the new mass is, in fact, dangerous to your faith. Not saying that you go to the new mass and then you just lose your faith, but it's got a drip effect. You go to the new mass and it's, you know, uh, the Lord be with you and uh, and also with you. And then we're going to have a little bit of a chat. And then we're going to, I suppose it's not fair for me to say that because that's not the essence of the new mass, but that's everybody's experience of the new mass. It's, it's, it's no longer, 
this is the sacrifice of Calvary. I went to a Catholic school. We used to have to go to mass. Well, initially it was once a week and then it eventually became, you know, over my high school years, it eventually became perhaps a couple of times a year. But the point was that nobody really knew what was going on, except ironically me, uh, because I was being actually catechized at home. Was this the sacrifice of Calvary? Uh, certainly not very clear if it was. Nobody was telling us that anyway. Yeah. And it's not really being uh, expressed by the right. So what the SSPX is saying is that the general law of the church is you are not obliged to a man-made law. Okay, Remember, the law to go to Mass on Sunday is a man-made law. The law to keep holy the Sabbath day is God's law, the third commandment. But you know that one of the commandments of the church is to go to Mass on Sundays. That's a man-made law. We are saying the general principle of man-made laws and church laws is that you're not obliged to go if there's a grave inconvenience. And I think that there's a grave inconvenience to go to my local Mass and then have all of this irreverence and the intrinsic lacks of the new Mass foisted on me Saturday night after Saturday night. And so that's the position of the society. It's not. It's not like we got the power to tell you not to go to the to mass anymore. It's just a logical position, and um, I think that's that's what I'm saying. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre was also very slow to do that. He was he was uh, saying, you know, when the new mass came out, he was saying, well, there's something dodgy about this, basing his judgment, and no doubt also on what Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci had said in the short critical examination of the new mass, that little booklet. Uh, there's something dodgy about this, but he was very slow to come to the conclusion that it's best not to go to that mass. But he said, you know, if there's a reason, uh, a reason of charity, an extrinsic reason, reason of uh, charity, funeral, marriage, uh, etc., then go to the mass, um, but don't participate because the mass in itself is something which is draining your faith. So it's a logical position, and it all comes back to the one thing, is if there genuinely is a crisis in the church, i.e. crisis of authority in a dangerous situation, then all of these things are logical and make sense. And that's why the Society of St. Pius X is not in this for itself. Okay? The Society of St. Pius X is not, uh, you know, we're not saving the church. We are not uh, the, the society out of which there is no salvation. We are merely following a very logical and true path. And that's why, you know, the Society of St. Pius X has not lapsed into schism, has not uh, lapsed into error, but is following uh, a narrow uh, a narrow path, but it is the correct one. And uh, I think that people know that you don't go to the SSPX because, you know, old priests are great or because they're really good at making, you know, decisions or the Gregorian chant is really good, although I do know it's great in Phoenix. Uh, no, you come to the SSPX because they have a true and logical position. They've got the right position on the faith. They may be wrong about all sorts of other things, and there may be even, you know, bad priests among them. It's got the correct position in the crisis. And those who say, well, no, you should be obedient, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in, in a crisis, there are slightly different principles you need to follow. I guess as we as we wrap up here, Father, and, and thank you again for taking all the time, how do we know when to obey and when not to obey? Because it, in some cases, I, I think if you're kind of half listening to what you've been saying over the last two and a half hours or so, Father, uh, it, it seems to me that some people could come away with the impression that Father Sherry is saying you don't always have to obey the Pope, you don't always have to obey Rome, that you can just kind of ignore them and just kind of do your own thing. Is that... Is, I'm, I'm sure that's not the impression you want to give, but could you just kind of finish with uh, some guidelines on how do you know who to listen to and when? Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up, Andrew, because uh, I think that is that is a very important uh, point, is that you could, as you say, if you, if you listen with maybe one and a half ears, you could conclude that what I'm saying is, well, actually, you don't need man-made laws, and actually, you don't need to obey, you know, really, um, all you need to do is look at God's laws. And I would like to cl uh, clarify and categorically state that I'm not saying that at all, is that it is wrong to scorn man-made laws, and we are obliged to keep man-made laws. So 
those who use the pretext that uh, there are some bad civil laws, such as laws, for example, which permit divorce or abortion, who would conclude from that that all the authority of the civil power is unjust and therefore I do not have to pay my taxes are wrong. Okay, it's uh, the the principles are fairly clear. Is that I must obey my lawful superior in all things over which uh, he has authority for me. Okay, all things that he has authority in, provided it not be against the law of God. Okay, now in the case of a child towards a parent, for example, the ch- the parent has authority over in all things except sin. And so I must obey in all things except sin. In the case of uh, other authority, the human authority has a limited authority. For example, you know, if you're at work and your boss tells you, okay, I'd like you to be a cashier today, he has authority. You do what you're told. Your boss says to you, you know, I don't like the fact that you're a Catholic, so stop being a Catholic. Well, he obviously doesn't have any authority in regards of that. And he doesn't have any authority if he tells you, for example, that you need to, uh, you know, you need to drink coffee rather than tea. It's just none of his business. And the same thing with the, uh, with the civil authority. It's limited. It's uh, the, the laws of the state and of the nation are there for the common good. But if, for example, that that law were to be unjust for some reason, for example, if the civil law were to say, well, okay, we're going to take all of your property off you because you're a Catholic. Okay, that's happened in many places, uh, not least in the penal times. Well, that's an unjust law. But what are you going to do? Like the recusants in England, they ended up you know, becoming bankrupt because they kept paying the fines. But they didn't have to pay the fines. They did so because that was going to bring about less damage. They were going to not go to jail if they paid the fines. And so you see that in the case of an unjust law, then you have to make a judgment based on prudence, what is the right thing to do. And so in the case that really concerns us, which is the laws of the church and obedience to the sovereign pontiff, clearly the sovereign pontiff has got no power to tell me to do something which is against God's law. And that applies to anything which is sinful in itself, such as taking part in an ecumenical uh, prayer meeting at a CC, which is against the first commandment, or you know, uh, taking part in animistic rites in various countries in the world, that's wrong. That's a sin. I must say no. Also, the authority of the Pope is there to protect the faith and not to undermine it. And so he does not have authority to get me to do something which is, in fact, undermining my faith. So if, for example... Unfortunately, this has happened in certain dioceses. The bishop says, well, okay, we need to accept, uh, you know, masses for the gay community. Okay, well, I'm sorry, that's undermining the moral law because there is one mass for all sinners. We're all sinners. They're sinners too. They go to that mass and they go to confession like the rest of us and they repent of their sins. Okay, if you have a mass for the so-called gay community, then what you're saying is, this particular way of living, this particular sin is good. And that's wrong. He's got no authority to do that. And so that's why the the principle is I must obey my lawful authority in all things for which he has authority stands. He does not have authority to get me to undermine my faith because he is there in order to lead me to God. Just as my father does not have the authority to uh, make me become an evangelical Christian. He's there to bring me to God. If my dad says to me that let's go to this occasion of sin, you know, I can say, I'm sorry, I'm not going. Okay. Now it may be I have no choice and I'm forced to go, but the principle is clear. And so because we're living in an exceptional circumstance, you know, the danger for us clearly would be to say, well, therefore we don't need authority. Okay? And that would be to, to enter into the Protestant error But the Society of St. Pius X is actually the opposite of the Protestant error. The Protestants said, Luther, as the first Protestant said, you've misinterpreted what revelation is until now. This is what it means. Society of St. Pius X is completely the opposite. It says, 
you're bringing up a new understanding of the faith. This is what we always used to say. And so it's the opposite. And that's why uh, it's very important for us not to say, well, that's it. We don't need to follow any civil laws, you know, because, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau or Joe Biden are, you know, they're, you know, despicable characters in a certain sense because of what they support in terms of immoral actions. Therefore, we don't need to obey any laws. That's not true at all. And it's not the example of the early Christians. Um, But what we do have to say is that I will nevertheless refuse to do what is against God's law. And in cases of those things which are not obviously against God's law, but are unjust, then I make a decision based on prudence. And as we said, equity and gnome. Father Sherry, it has been great chatting with you and thank you so much for taking the time to go through uh, these questions. These are questions that have been uh, swirling around for a while and I know a lot of people have concerns about them. So I appreciate all your time and efforts to uh, make them uh, a little bit more intelligible for us. I appreciate the opportunity to do so, uh, Andrew, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to or watching the SSPX podcast. Please keep in mind the best way to help more people see these videos and to hear this podcast is to subscribe on YouTube or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and rate or review wherever you listen. Also, please remember, this is an apostolate. It's free to listen or to watch anytime, but we also need your help. Would you please consider submitting a one-time donation or sign up for a small $5, $10, or $20 a month donation at sspxpodcast.com? This helps us to continue this important work of sharing the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism with as many people as possible. Until next time, thank you for listening, and God bless you.